Sports Talk Daily with Andrew Hustler Patterson and Michael Remus. <laughs> oh, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Happy Friday to you all. We got a big <laughs> we got a big show today. Um Lots to get to on the Winnipeg Jets after a uh, a pretty depressing end to the preseason last night, uh, and of course we will we're going to talk Jets for probably the first half of the show. Ken Weeb's going to come on, and listen, th- th- there's a l- level of disappointment with the injury to Vili Hanela being shut up by the Sens, Nikolai Ehlers' situation right now, um, but I promise we will crank up the positive vibes. When we're talking about the Bombers and Lions tonight, the biggest game of the year, Ed Tate's going to join us from Vancouver uh, around the top of the second hour, and um, we will crank it up. And hopefully we can try and crank up some positive vibes, although it might be a little difficult considering what happened last night and the um, just cruel injury to Billy Hanela after the camp that he had last night. Uh, we're going to get to all of that. Ken's coming on a little earlier than normal today because of the uh, Winnipeg Jets practice, which is uh, underway right now. We'll get to all that in a minute and then uh, talk a little CFL. And, of course, Hacksaw will jump on for the NFL Notebook before we drop the marbles closer to 3 p.m. today on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Just before we get into it, a big shout-out to the sponsors that make WST happen each and every day. Our friends at Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada, Consolidated Supply, Royal Sports, BP, Winnipeg Jets, Little Brown Jug, Nick and Nicky DQ, F Apparel, Wallace and Wallace, Vita Health Fresh Market, Canadian Club, Manitoba Battery, Modern Man Barber Shops, and Aquatech. Michael Remus, I, I, I took a big sigh um, as we uh, as we be, began the program and we do our little chat before we go live. And I looked over and I was just about to get the the chat open, and what do we see? But the the thumbnail is Billy Hanel getting carried off to the uh, carried off to the dressing room last night. Um, we were both there last night. We'll talk more about the tour we got to the arena later on, which was awesome. And thanks to the hospitality, the folks at the Jets were doing that as well as a bunch of other mainly Winnipeg foodies. That was fun. We'll talk about that later on. But man, you could just feel the deflation of the fans. And to be honest, some of the team last night after that injury to Billy. We've been talking about him and like the one key position battle of training camp for weeks here. And it's like a horrible end to a like reality TV series. You've been following, like if the Jets were a reality show, you've been following this character. Is he going to make the team? He's bulked up. He's having the training camp of his life. He's earning a spot after years of disappointment. And to get injured in the first game, not that, sorry, the final game, um, horrible. And, you know, you're hoping that it's not going to be a long-term injury. Then Rick Bonus comes out at the end and says, oh, yeah, it's not a short-term injury, which, you know, they usually don't say anything. They always say, you know, we're going to do tests and we'll find out tomorrow and we'll let you know. Uh, they seem to know right away that, you know, that this is, that he's going to be out for a while. We'll hear more maybe maybe today. Um, you know, you hear Brendan Dillon talk after and Mason Appleton. I mean, everyone just feels... For the guy, it's just a, hor- a horrible end to the preseason. Uh, one thing it does, you know, we've been talking about, well, which defenseman is going to go on waivers? Well, now because of this injury, they don't have to make that decision, which we always thought was a possibility, but not, to use a quote what, from the Matrix, not like this. Like, you don't want, didn't want to see this happen. No, well, t- definitely not. And, and to be honest, after... You know, Vili went out. And, and listen, I, I realize that we've all spent a lot of time talking about, you know, what's potentially the sixth defenseman on the Winnipeg Jets. But for a team that has been regressing the last couple seasons, and obviously it made a big trade with uh, with Pierre-Luc Dubois and brought in some, you know, some veteran players in uh, Ayafalo and Velarde and to a lesser degree Rasmus Kapari. Um, you know, it, it's very similar to last year. And you know, we've talked a lot about turning it over and getting some new blood and new life in this club. And I really thought Billy had kind of been that guy that had done that through training camp. And without him, 
Um, listen, the onus is going to be on everyone to step it up because that team wasn't very good last night. They didn't score. They had a few chances. Um, but I really thought that, you know, the present, if Billy Hanlon was on the team and in the lineup to begin the season, I thought that that would have been, you know, a great addition of a little bit of fresh blood into the team that could really help it. Um, but as we learned yesterday after the game, um, and maybe we'll get some more clarity at some point during the show today after Rick Bonus speaks. Uh, this is not a short-term injury, and uh, and you could just tell by the reaction of players speaking about it afterwards. So first things first, I know everyone in the chat, Billy's really got a lot of fans in uh, in here and in this city that we're pulling for him. We'll continue to pull for him through uh, hopefully uh, as quick of a recovery as possible and see him back out there. But he will be missed, and I think his presence and just the influence of you know a new younger player with that level of excitement that a guy like that brings to the team is um, you know it's a real blow for the Winnipeg Jets right now. Um, as I say, usually Remo and I chop it up a little more before the start of the show, um, but we're we're working around Kenny's schedule to the uh, with the Jets because they're on the ice right now. He's going to hook up with us in a minute. Um, so just before we do that, you can see my fresh cut. Shout out to our friends at Modern Man Barbershop. Uh, great stop down at the Pemino location uh, the other day. Of course, Modern Man now has eight locations in Winnipeg, uh, including the newest locations at that Pemino location right by Bishop Grandin and over on Plessy Road. And Modern Man's got you covered for everything you need, fellas. Haircuts, beard ca- shaping, shaves, color services, and more. Uh, special bonus if you go to the Pemino location, say hi to the coolest dog in the haircutting game, Toby. Um, and they did a great job throwing the game on for me while I got my hair cut. So it was uh, it's a great experience. Um, as they say, you can book your look at any of the eight locations at modernmanbarber.com. And then give them a follow on Instagram at modernmanbarbershops. Uh, well, pool season is over. If you're thinking about making 2024 the year you take the plunge, you can get in touch with our friends at Aquatech. But what you might not know is they're busy all year round with incredible home renovations. Uh, thousands of rentals as their foundation. Aquatech can upgrade any space in your home. If you're ready to enhance your kitchen, your bathroom, or even add a man cave to your spot, visit aqua-tech.ca to learn more about their whole home renovations, including financing options. And uh, a little chilly out there, folks. I hate to tell you, but yeah, winter is on the way. And while Manitoba Battery powered us through all the fun of the summer with boat batteries and campers and lawn tractors and everything that comes with summer, now it's time to get serious to get through the Winnipeg winter and Manitoba Battery is there for you. Your local option with the best prices in town and the best service as well. Not only will you get the best price on your car or truck battery, but Manitoba Battery will also deliver it to you anywhere in the city for free with any purchase over 60 bucks. It's just that easy. Head on over to manitobabattery.com. Check out everything they've got for you. You can order online or give them a call at 783-8787. Donnie's great staff will help you through the entire process and then get it to you. And hey, if you do want to test your battery or pop by and see them in person, you can always do that at 1026 Logan Avenue. And uh, hey, just before we uh, bring in Weaver, a big cheers to our friends at Canadian Club, official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Hopefully around midnight or so, there might be a few uh, victory cheers amongst Bomber fans with a little CC or maybe some CC and ginger in the pre-mixed cocktails. Of course, Canadian Club available at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. And if you're popping in your local beer store to grab a couple racks for the weekend, take a look for CC and ginger available in cans at pretty much all local beer stores as well. All right, let's get to it. Uh, Live from the Hockey for Life Center, uh, our pal Ken Weeb from the Winnipeg Free Press joins us now. Weber, uh, great to have you on the program. Uh, What's going on out uh, at the rink? Andrew, great to be with you as well. Here's a live look at the activities in the Hockey for All Center. Look at this. We have a lot of, yeah, we got live streaming happening here. Uh, We're doing, the Jets are doing a lot of, uh, Four checking drills, a little bit of neutral zone play, a lot of uh, tempo is being called for us. Uh, no surprise given how things were in that final preseason game. Jets didn't really get to speed. It was you know, way too much special teams play, but overall I think the Jets are looking to get faster as they get into the season opener on Wednesday against the Calgary Flames. But uh, that's where we're at. Happy to be uh, back inside the rink. It was a busy week, as you know, but 
I think everyone in the NHL has reached the same point. Everyone is ready for the preseason to be over and for the meaningful games to begin. Well, unfortunately, not everyone seems to be ready for the preseason to be Fair. over. Uh, I don't. Uh, I see uh, no number twenty-seven out there today. What? Uh, what's what's going on? Well, I guess Rick sort of alluded to this yesterday. I think he dropped. Uh, we'll see on Monday, and then that wasn't uh, you know wasn't a sign necessarily of how long it's going to take. But the Jets, I think, are having a, a team bonding weekend uh, Saturday Sunday scheduled to be off, I believe. So. Uh, the next full practice will be Monday, and then then we will have a real indication about whether or not Nikolai Ehlers will be ready for the season opener. Uh, I would always say uh, in, until you see him being ruled out, he's still a possibility, and I do still expect him to play in that opener. But obviously this thing with the next spasms is taking uh, longer than we all were anticipating, including Nikolai, I'm sure. Uh, but as of right now, with Parker Ford being reassigned to the Manitoba Moose, the uh, decision-making process uh, is getting a little bit easier to identify. They're down to basically uh, Axel Janssen Fialbi would currently be the 14th, but if Nikolai Ehlers is not available, and again, we don't know that that's the case yet, but they're down to only having to make one cut, if any, up front, depending on whether or not if Ehlers suddenly has to go on IR, then suddenly Axel Janssen Fialbi could be on the team. And obviously, you know, you're talking about Billy Hainala going uh, out of the gates here, and obviously you know, just... Terrible luck for him, Huss. As you mentioned, he's had such a great camp. Uh, and as basically everything Vili Hainel was asked to do by the coaching staff going into said training camp, uh, he was able to do efficiently and effectively uh, to the point where, honestly, I believe he was a legitimate candidate to not only be on the uh, opening night or opening season roster, but to be one of the six to start the season on Wednesday in Calgary. Now, We'll never know if that's the case or not because, uh, as we know right now, Nate Schmidt is working with Brennan Dillon on that third pairing. So, uh, And Rick Bonus obviously doesn't need to tell us because it's not an option anymore. So, uh, But as you mentioned, I mean, Nick Billy played very well throughout the play uh, throughout the preseason here. I really liked the way he played an assertive game. And Hus, you were here on day one. Um, Scott Billick sending his regards. Yeah, shout out um, to the chat from Billick. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, as you know, from being here in the rink, Billy did not actually have a overtly excellent start to training camp. There were fumbled pucks. There were uh, plays he would normally make were not being made. Uh, and finally, I think, you know, Niederreiter came over to him, tapped him on the shin pads, and he took a deep breath. And from that point on, Quite frankly, he was one of the best Jets defensemen. Now, it's important to remember level of competition and all those other things. I'm, I'm not here to report Billy would have been the Jets' best defenseman this year, uh, but he certainly was putting himself in a position to be one of the best six to start the year. So, tough break for him. Obviously, we don't have any information, but us uh, based on the way he fell uh, to the ice and wasn't able to put any weight on it, I mean, it would not be a stretch to suggest you know, high ankle sprain would be the best guess at this point. Now, without seeing the medical records and having a, a full you know, diagnosis, you know, could it be Achilles? Could it be his knee? Of course. But um, the fact that Rick had said right after the game that it was going to be long term, there aren't a ton of lower body injuries that you can immediately assess and know it's going to be longer term. And to me, you know, it could be his knee, but. Normally, you need the swelling to go down in order to see anything on the on the visual that is required in order to make the assessment that it would be longer term. So, I would think it's an ankle injury, and again, terrible luck for Billy Hainala. I would done. at this point, Ken, I would take a high ankle sprain that might oh, yeah? be six to eight weeks. Well, okay. I, I mean, listen, I just saw. I mean, I was at the game last night. I saw the replay a bunch of times. And when you hear Rick and like the disappointment of Brendan Dillon afterwards, oh, yeah. I mean, that was ominous. And listen, maybe that was just the reaction in the heat of the moment, knowing that, listen, this was going to be an extended period of time out. Um, because it, it is sort of crushing. And as I mentioned off the top, like, again, we could be talking about a guy that was playing the sixth defenseman. And there is bigger problems right now with this team scoring goals, the power play. I mean, we just haven't seen a lot from the team so far through the preseason. I understand some of the angst that's growing and the concern maybe for the club. But the one thing about having Billy in there is it, it 
it does feel like it's a little bit of fresh young blood into the team that's not really coming from anywhere else right now. And I thought that would have been good for the Winnipeg Jets to have on the roster, to have in the room, to have on the ice. And uh, listen, it's, uh, it, it is going to be up to every single one of the guys in that dressing room to step up. And I'm not saying that, you know, he's would come in almost like when Nate Schmidt came in a couple of years ago, kind of to be the vibes guy, if you will. And the, uh, director of positive attitudes, but I, 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 you know, just sort of felt that, you know, he was a piece that could make this team a little different to move it forward from what it has been. And, um, listen, it's, it's devastating for him. Um, but man, you felt it after the game and hearing the, uh, the comments from the players and the coaching staff speaking to this. So, um, I'm just hoping it's not catastrophic, which would be, well, Achilles, if it's Achilles, I mean, that's the season, right? I mean, that's basically, or if it's a, you know, knee serious knee injury but it just the way that he felt looked more like an it kind of like his ankle fell underneath him huh so you know like you said it, even if it is a high ankle it could be more eight weeks but we'll see what happens let's let's just we don't want to we don't where i know we're asked to play uh, doctors on tv once in a while and on the youtube channel but uh let's just see what where the assessment is and see where things go but yeah i mean uh, to your point about the enthusiasm for sure but I just think it's important. I mean, Billy would have been playing, you know, in that 15 minute range and only on, you know, on the, not only, but on the second power play. So Billy, as great a camp as he had, Hussey, he hadn't put himself in a position to be an impact player. He could have, he could have an impact, but we're not talking about a guy who is going to be guaranteed top four minutes. Now, could Billy have earned himself top four minutes over the course of the season? If he had kept it up, of course, but I mean, it's a, the type of injury where, you know, of course there's a higher ceiling with Billy in comparison to Nate Schmidt, but Nate hasn't really had an opportunity to play outside of that first game. So I don't think that there's necessarily going to be a catastrophic drop-off provided Nate is able to play, you know, at the level he played at in the playoffs and maybe down the stretch. So having said all that, I mean, hopefully Billy can get himself back healthy and contribute before the season is over because, to your point, out of the opening – we still don't know what's happening in terms of seven and eight right now. And, and I mean, you guys are right about Chisholm, I think, but there still are nine defensemen without Vili Hainala. So unless Kyle Capabianco is going on IR, the Jets still have a decision to make with the defense crew in order to get to their opening day roster, especially if there are concerns about maybe needing to carry – a 14th forward and Axel Janssen Fialbi if Ehlers is unable to be ready for game one. So how do you see it playing out? I mean, I, oh, I would assume uh, that Nate Schmidt's the guy that's in the oh, lineup. He's definitely in right now. Huss. He's playing with Brendan Dillon at the tr at the practice today. So then we got Capo, you got Stan, and you got and Declan Chisholm. Chisholm. How do so, they figure it out, Ken? Oh, like, if, if you, if you, what's your best guess right now? In the preseason. Oh. Sorry, we, we I, I lost you briefly there. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, what's your best guess on how this would play out? I mean, if you had to say, and put it this way, if one guy, one guy will have to go on waivers if those players are not there, who's the most likely one? Put it this way, never mind what they're going to do. Who's the most likely one to get through waivers, in your opinion? I would say the most likely to get through is probably Kyle Capabianco because he's not a first round pick and he's a guy who has, he was the number eight guy last year. Now, We've talked about this before ad nauseum, Huss, and I think if the team is keeping eight, Kyle Capabianco is the perfect eighth defenseman because you know he can sit for long stretches and come into the lineup. So we've seen a lot of guys get claimed recently, guys like Lassie Thompson, uh, you know, big first rounders. So uh, do I, I can't even really venture a guess because Chisholm lost all of that time because of his own lower body injury during training camp here. So it's almost impossible to guess, but if I had to guess, I would say Kyle Capabianco. But in the same breath that I'm saying that, I think Capabianco would be the perfect eighth guy for the Jets this year, given his skill set, and that he has a long history of showing that he can sit for stretches and jumping in. We don't have the same history when it comes to Logan Stanley. Can Logan Stanley go a month, come in, and then play 12 minutes and kill penalties and do a lot of things effectively? We're not sure he's well, missed it long happened stretches. last year and it didn't go well, very because well. Because of injuries, though, that that was injury related. Us never mind having to come back from an injury. What's it like when when you're the guy doing the bag skates for three four weeks at a time 
and trying to stay sharp when you're asked, you know, especially for a road game when the coach doesn't have the ability to try to shelter those guys because you got to play them eventually. And if you, if you don't trust playing them, they shouldn't be in the lineup. So, yeah, I mean, the Jets still have big choices. And, I mean, Declan Chisholm is a guy that you feel horrible for him as well because Hus, this is a guy who was given a chance to run the first power play units when he was playing. And then basically he was taken out of the competition for the last two games, essentially two or three games here. So I guess it was only two, but still it just, just forgot. We lose Ken's uh, internet connection there. All right, yeah. Kenny, you're back there. We it just it went you. into the red. Yeah. He was green until you now. were, uh, you were speaking about uh, about Declan Chisholm, who, um, you know, is uh, listen. I, I think Ken was onto something there. I mean, I think Declan Chisholm was given every much the opportunity that uh, Billy was at the beginning of uh, of camp. But uh, as we so we ended up going into last night's game, and we saw that you know you had the th- the three pairings that were playing in the game, and Billy was with Dylan, and then you had Stan and, Lo- and uh, Nate Schmidt. It was, um, Ken, from my perspective, I think pretty clear that Declan Chisholm, at least as of yesterday, was sort of the ninth defenseman. And that would lend someone to believe that maybe he would be on the way to the Manitoba Moose. I talked about this yesterday. I think we always have a tendency to maybe overvalue prospects that we see all the time or the ones in the teams that we cover. Um, but I think there is still is a legitimate concern that he would get picked up on waivers. I mean, uh, and that and that is not something the Winnipeg Jets want to have happen, especially after um, you know Johnny Kovacevic has sort of turned into a pretty reliable guy for the Montreal Canadiens, um, having been lost on the waiver wire last year. Uh, totally fair, Huss. I mean, one thing I would I would just quickly caution, and, and this is not a knock on Johnny Kovacevic at all, but he basically was in the rotation at a time when Joel Edmondson was hurt. And he was playing on one of the worst teams in the NHL. Now, that's not to say Kovacevic. I don't just, you know, Johnny is a guy I think could have played on the Jets roster, but I don't think he would have been in the top six as often as he was in Montreal. But having no, said that, that's why the court, waiver wire, that's how waivers work. It, it's supposed to work. And, and I mean, the listen, thing, the, the, uh, the, you know, the Leafs or the Oilers or whatever, the top contenders probably aren't jumping on a Declan Chisholm. But there's exactly. some pretty bad teams in the National Hockey League that might look at that guy going, this guy's probably better than the guys we have right now. He's young. He's done a lot at the AHL level. Why wouldn't we take a chance on that guy? And that's the the predicament that Kevin Sheveldayoff finds himself in getting closer to uh, the deadline. Yeah, for sure, Huss. Uh, and again, I don't think Chisholm would clear waivers, even though he's a fifth-round draft pick. I mean, I think he's still one of the best Jets defense prospects. Now, we've talked about this regularly. I think that Elias Solomonson has moved ahead of him, but he's going back to Skeleftia. So he's not an option for this year. So of course the Jets wouldn't want to lose Declan Chisholm for nothing. But you're right, the waiver wire has been has shown that it can work positively. And it was great for Johnny Kovacevic to get that opportunity to play in the NHL last season with Montreal. You know, I can assure you he was happy making a one-way deal. It didn't matter to him that he was playing on one of the worst teams. He was playing in the NHL. That's everyone's goal. Same for right now. You know, some folks getting uh, bent out of shape about the Jan. Great for Jansen, but Jansen isn't in the Jets' top 12 right now. So, And if he's not going to be in the top 12 or 14, then he should be given an opportunity to play with someone else, which is what he's been done, what's been doing with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Now it's up to Jansen Harkins to show that he can stay there for the year, and you know he'll be feeling rejuvenated, Huss. So... Uh, it'll be interesting, and I, I don't. I, I still I envision Declan Chisholm being on the roster, but now the predicament is Declan Chisholm needs to be playing and not sitting in the press box. But Declan Chisholm also is will be happy to be making NHL money and practicing with NHL players. But at the same time, you want to get him some games. And to your point earlier on, Hus, not today, but earlier, if Declan Chisholm is in fact seven or eight. I think the Jets need to have a little bit more of a frequent rotation on that third pairing to ensure a guy like Declan Chisholm is going to enhance his development. But Huss, it's also incumbent on the player to force his way into the lineup in those situations because this is not a development league. The Jets are trying to win now. You know, of course, they want to play Declan Chisholm, but, you know, sometimes 
it's up to the player to show that he's better than the guys in the top six. And that's something that Rick said right at the beginning of training camp. Yeah, no doubt. Ken Weeb from the Winnipeg Free Press with us live on Winnipeg Sports Talk from the Iceplex where the Jets are on the ice. Um, again, we've talked a lot about the blue line and the big story coming out of last night's game was the the, the very unfortunate injury to Billy Hanala. So we wanted to talk about that. But overall, Ken, um, <laughs> I mean, you know me, I'm a positive guy. I love to get fired up and I'm always ready to go when every team's tied for first place before game number one. But I did not leave the rink last night with, and I mean, maybe it was the Paul that was sort of cast over the game by the injury to Villy. I mean, that was a tough blow for fans. Everyone was talking about it in the stands last night throughout the game. Um, but that did not look like a team ready to uh, ready to put their best foot forward in game number one. Uh, what were your takeaways from last night, and uh, where were your areas of concern when you look at the Jets before they take on the Flames on Wednesday? Yeah, Hus, first and foremost, and I know that you're not suggesting this, but a 2-3-1 and one record means absolutely jack when Wednesday's games start. Uh, I understand the concerns about not scoring, but like, let's look at the goals the Jets allowed. In a game where there were way too many power plays on both sides, uh, they gave up a, a backdoor one-timer on a perfect pass. They gave up a breakaway goal to Claude Giroux, and the third goal was kind of a crazy one where it hit Josh Bailey in the shoulder, and he had a spin-around snapper uh, where there was a guy standing right in front of Hellebuck. So to me, I, yes, I understand it was a 3 nothing game, but I, I don't think that the Jets got skated into the ice by by Ottawa Senators' team yesterday. Uh, what, what I think happened is that the Jets kind of got themselves going in the second period and were out shooting their opponent wildly, I think 12-5 at one point, and then all of a sudden it was just a parade to the penalty box and then they were able to get no sustained offensive pressure. So uh, yesterday's game doesn't concern me. Uh, I also think that there are players that, you know, quite frankly, are ready for the season to get going. Uh, I think that the Jets are fine. And, you know, you talked about the, the influx of enthusiasm, and I would say that influx is still there. You have it from Ajax Alafalo, who is now playing a, you know, I, you, let's call it a middle six role, but he's playing with Cole Perfetti. I mean, there's a huge opportunity for Alex Alafalo. You look at Gabe Velarde, Gabe's gone from being a third-line player in L.A. to being a first-line player with Kyle Connor and Mark Shifley. And Rasmus Kapari, yes, he's starting on the fourth line, but shown that he can be a pretty capable penalty killer and a guy who isn't afraid. I mean, he got involved physically with Brady Kachuk. So he's going to be a guy that grows on the fan base uh, quite quickly, I would imagine. Um, you know, I, I didn't like the Parker Kelly hit on Mark Shifley. It was late. It was high. Uh, you know, and we know that there's history with those players. What, Parker what was Kelly's, that history? What was that the history? The history is, he's the guy that knocked Mark Shifley out of the 22 season with a, I think it was either a separated shoulder or a collarbone. Uh, he passed the puck off the boards in a game in Winnipeg. Uh, it was, I wouldn't say it was late, but it was definitely a bruising hit. And he missed the last nine games. And then the next time we saw Mark speak was when he said he was going to be assessing his own personal future. And that set off the old off-season firestorm. So... Uh, I think what happened, Mark didn't like the hit to begin with, and then he saw it was was Parker Kelly, and then he gave him a two-hander in the back of the legs and was like, you know, you've knocked me out for an extended period once before, and I don't think I want you to do it again. So, you know, good on him for showing that fire. I know some people were a little bit curious on why he got so fired up, but, I mean, if someone has ended your season previously and they take a run at you in a 3 nothing game in the waning moments... That's the kind of reaction that you like to see from a guy, even though, I mean, Mark's not a guy that's going to drop the gloves a whole lot, and, and he, nor should he. But I, I liked his response there, and I think if that game would have been lasting longer, I'm pretty sure somebody uh, in a, in a uh, you know different uh, pugilistic class would have made his way over to Mr. Kelly uh, and said, hey there, uh, that's not acceptable here. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I listen, I'll say one thing about Shife. Um you know, in, in a game that was lethargic um, and a third period that was basically spent ex almost exclusively on special teams. Um, I didn't I didn't mind him showing, you know, a little bit of emotion and a little bit of fire. I, I mean, I, I think that that's something this team to a man needs more of when things get going. I mean, it was really lacking last year at times. And I think that sort of well, to use an old Mauriceism uh, malaise through the second half of the season, that was one of the things we've talked about. Like, who... Who are the spark plugs? Who are the emotional leaders on this team? And 
I mean, I'll ask you this right now, Ken, and I'm interested in your perspective on this. So from when the season ended last year to where we are today, Blake Wheeler's gone. Pierre-Luc Dubois is gone. I'm trying to think about who the 12th forward was. Maybe it was Axel who could be uh, on the roster, Saku Menelainen, whatever. That was the uh, third guy. And then you and then we're bringing in the three guys. The Def- goalie is the same. Obviously, Brassois is a backup, but let's assume Hellebuck's in net. The exact same six defensemen, and everyone else is there. Are the Jets better right now going into game one than they were at the end of last season? Some things, Huss, and the big part of the mystery in the equation, and I understand why folks like yourself and many other uh, Jets supporters would have question marks, but we don't know if the Jets are going to be the October 10th to January 17th version or if they're going to be the January 17th version to the April 29th version. So until we see that, it's almost impossible to predict. What I do know, Huss, is that the forward group is deeper. Now, will they have as much high-end talent? Now, that's up to Gabe Velarde and Ajax follow to a certain degree. I mean, they are. You know, there are some goals they're going to have to replace, but some of that's got to be internal, Huss. Kyle Connor went from 47 to 31. Kyle needs to be a 40-goal guy this year. I think the Jets are better if they have Cole Perfetti and Nikolai Ehlers in the lineup. I think the defensive improvements will have to come as a cumulative group because, as you mentioned, it's the same players. Now, Josh took Josh Morrissey took a huge step forward last year. Uh, can he take another one? I mean, he's put in the work to do so. The Jets need, you've said it countless times, and I couldn't agree more. Neil Pionk having a bounce-back season is essential for the Jets to being better. And I expect him to be better than he was last year because he looks healthier. Now, I understand some folks are concerned about how he's played in the preseason. Let's not worry about the preseason. That it, The preseason means nothing. It's a shake the rust off and get ready to roll. It's another story. So I think the Jets are in the exact same position, Huss, as they were last October. This is a bubble team. This is not a team that I expect to contend with Colorado and Dallas, though I also don't expect them to be left in the dust by those teams. But they're anywhere from third to fifth. And, you know, in the Central, fourth might not be enough this year, given the talent in the Pacific Division. So I think it's Jets, Wild, Blues, or I'm going to actually say Nashville ahead of the Blues because I like their goaltending better. But those three teams are kind of battling for, let's just say, one and a half spots right now, Huss. I do think the Jets will get into the playoffs either as the third seed or the wild card, but they're battling with teams like Calgary and Seattle and some of those other clubs in the Pacific that are going to be in that sort of realm and range in terms of possibilities. And Huss, don't underestimate the importance of a better backup in Lauren Brassois, and I'm not saying that you are, but the difference between David Riddick, who the Jets couldn't even play because they didn't trust him, after that game against Columbus, the difference between Brassois, a guy who was in the net for the best team in the Western Conference and was in the net through early in the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs, that's a huge boost for the Jets to be able to keep Hellebuck fresh and to have a, a, a backup who is a little bit more capable. And us, you know my feelings about David Riddick. He had a great start to the year, but he led in a, a, a one that required... Had, had a fairly succinct odor in each of his last three starts, and that made the Jets basically start Hellebuck for 13 or 14 games in a row. And then he was on fumes when the playoffs started. So well, it, was, it was also where the team was in the standings. Well, I that's mean, what dro- I mean. They dropped so much. I mean, every game was like a playoff game, basically, for the last 12, 13 games, and they needed to go, uh, they needed to go with their guy. Um, and I don't disagree with you, but Ken... Um, to, to me, this, I mean, this is, this team has seemed like it's been at a crossroads for the better part of the last 18 months, and they're still there right now. Yeah. At some point, decisions are going to be made, and this is why I feel that the start to this season will mean everything to the direction that they go at this crossroads. Like, if this team has, a, if, if we get the same start we had last year from the Winnipeg Jets, and they're sniffing around first place in the central and look like very much a playoff team. I think they continue on with everything that they've told us, 
But I mean, if this team comes out of the gate poorly and is well uh, is out of a playoff spot around American Thanksgiving and we get into December and it looks like that they have a have a big hill to climb to get there. Do you not think that that would create a, a change of plans, shall we say, because of the situations around some of their most important players? Uh, I don't see the Jets changing course, basically. I think they're committed. You're good. I think he did freeze there. Oh, he did freeze. Well, we'll we'll get Weaver back with uh, with a little bit of extra extra drama to his answer about that. I just say, like, I don't know how you could stay the course uh, if uh, listen. I, we'll cross this bridge when we come to it. But this comes back to my point that the first three months of the season, I think, is really going to determine in a lot of ways. You know what happens with Connor Hellebuck? What happens with Mark Scheifele? Um, hell, what happens with some of the other players that the Winnipeg Jets have? on expiring contracts like a Brendan Dillon, like a Dylan DeMello. I mean, all of these all of these players, you know, would have value elsewhere in the league. And if it's time to move on, if it's time to 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 make that, you know, to take that that turn, if you will, and how it is, I mean, that could affect all of those guys. Um Ken, if we've got you back, um you were just about to say that, you know, if the team does have a rough few months, you still think that they stay the course. How does that look? Sorry, I mean, I don't see the Jets rebuilding. I could see a further reload, Huss, for sure, and that may mean moving one or both of the players we've been talking about for almost 12 months now. Uh, But the Jets are not going to be tearing this team down if they have a bad start, Huss. And my only argument with you when it comes to the start, Huss, last year the Jets' start didn't mean anything. It was their best start in franchise history, and they only got to eighth place. Now, it's important to realize making the playoffs is hard, yes. But I think the real test for the Jets is going to be January to April in terms of the – and now specifically to March 8th when it comes to the two players we've been talking about in Hellebuck and Shifley. Now, that's not to say a trade can't happen before that. Of course it could. And if they stumble out of the gate terribly and they're way out of it at American Thanksgiving, yes, I think you could fast forward on maybe potential trades, but – To me, the bigger thing we're going to learn about the Jets, yeah, of course they need to get up to a good start if they want to make the playoffs. But in terms of direction, they need to play well when it matters. They've been notorious front runners, Huss. So being a front runner and starting well is helpful because they needed it in order to make it. But they need to play well when the games get hard and when it matters most. This team's done a great job of being ready out of the gate. But when the league adjusts and it gets harder, that's when they've had their issues over the last couple of years when they've had good teams. So uh, that'll be the truer test for me. Well, I guess that's my point. I just mean like if they're not in that situation and they don't look like a playoff team, you know, what, uh, uh, during a time where they've traditionally been a lot better, what does that do to the challenges to move this thing forward with the big picture in mind as opposed to exhausting everything to maybe slide into that last spot like they did last year? My, my argument is, why wouldn't this team, you know, you asked me if I thought they were better. I, I They'll be better at certain things. Now, why would you think the Jets would be in that position at American Thanksgiving where they would consider selling? I mean, they're deeper at forward than they've ever been, potentially, at the start of a season anyway. You could argue that at the end of 2018, they were maybe deeper than this team and maybe a few more higher-end talents. But they also have elite goaltending, huh? So... If you have four lines you can play and you have one of the best goalies in the NHL and quite conceivably one of the best one Bs or backups, I don't know how they could be in that situation where they're, you know, a bottom five team. Like, could they be 14th to 18th or 20th? Sure. But I don't see a scenario where this team is so bad that it is in the lottery sweepstakes thinking about a top five pick. I just don't see it based on the talent level and what we saw what we saw Rick Bonus do with this team in a short span of time in terms of defensive zone commitment. Although they abandoned it for a good chunk of the last 30 games, I think Rick having his second year at the helm will help improve some of those defensive deficiencies, especially when you consider all three of the guys they got from L.A. Huss 
are sound defensive players, right? And especially Ayafalo, who might be one of the best two-way wingers in the league when it comes to his defensive awareness, and he's a regular 14 to 18 goal scorer. So I think even in that regard, now it's up to Velarde to take a big step in his career. If Velarde goes from 23 to 30, I mean, he's already replaced Pierre-Luc Dubois' goal scoring. And we know that he's also a very capable defensive zone player. And I just think, Hus, of course, the, it's it's reliant on health when it comes to Cole Perfetti and Ehlers. But even though 31 goals is a lot of goals, I don't see a scenario where Kyle Connor is in the low 30s. I expect him to be a 40 goal guy again this year, Hus. This guy is one of the has one of the best releases in the NHL. We know he got frustrated early by the posts and the crossbars. I expect him to have a big impact out of the gate. And if he does that, and we know about Mark Scheifele's motivation uh, in terms of having a great season, I don't think the Jets will score less than last year, but I think they'll have a chance to defend better. Now, there's a lot of other variables with the roster, and what happens with Hellebuck and Scheifele will play a massive role in where they ultimately end up. But I don't see them being a, a bad team in October and November. Now, if that happens, now, of course, we're going to look at this conversation. You can show the receipts that I looked like I didn't know what I was talking about. But I don't expect the Jets to have a I'm bad. not saying that they're going to be. I'm just I'm just acknowledging that, to me, this, this is the most fascinating team in the league. I could see them being very good. I could see them being not very good. And if yeah. it goes that direction... I think it almost forces the team to do some things that maybe they haven't wanted. Well, they clearly haven't wanted to or been able to do up until this point. And and that's why, I mean, a good start. I mean, I'm staring at this October schedule and yep. seeing the teams that they're playing. I mean, you know, you don't get off to a good start. If you're all of a sudden playing catch-up in November, um, I think it sort of changes the equation, which is why... I guess there's I, I have angst and a lot of people have angst that we really haven't seen the team together. We certainly haven't seen anything click for the most part in the preseason. And listen, all the other games, whatever. But I was really hoping to see a team that, frankly, looked ready to go for the regular season. And I'm not sure we really saw that last night. You mentioned Mark Shifley. This is our last chance to get to before the season starts. Um, what are your expectations for the season for Mark this year? Yeah, I'd say 35 to 40 goals and 80 to 90 points for Mark. I honestly think that this is a highly motivated player and not just for reasons people think. This is, of course, he wants to make money on his next deal. Uh, this is a guy who, um, let's not forget, Hus. One of his biggest mentors knows a lot about legacy, Hus. Uh, that person had a statue erected of him outside the building last season. Uh, Mark knows that if this is his last year, He's not going to want to go out with people feeling like he's a selfish player that uh, suddenly went from the poster child of Jets 2.0 to being someone that people want to drive to the airport and run him out of town. I, I don't see that being a factor. I think this is a guy who still has an open mind about staying. And I think if Mark has a great year, not just a great offensive year, but invests on the two-way side of the game, something we saw a lot during the first 40 to 50 games last year, they're not asking him to be a Selkie Trophy winner, Hus. I've said this to you a lot of times over the years. Elite offensive players need to be adequate defensively, and you just can't have the lapses that Mark has had uh, at times over the years. But I expect him to have a big year, and I I think it's more likely that Shifley signs an extension than Hellebuck as of this moment. But again, a lot can change in a in a short span of time. I expect Mark to have a big year. And I expect him to you know, be diligent away from the puck as well as being a high point producer. I'll say one thing about that top line. Um, and I, 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 you know, maybe it's because I spent a lot more time just focusing on Velarde during the preseason when those yep. guys were together because he's a new player. Um, but he does have a knack, even on the power play, for still remembering what can happen the other way. Um, he seemed to be in the right spot a lot of times in uh, defensive roles, and uh, certainly that's going to help that uh, that line as well. As far as the forwards go, if I if I asked you who is a guy, like let's put the positive vibe, let's crank up the positive vibes here. Who is a guy, Ken, that when you look at this roster, you think, 
will have a season that exceeds most people's expectations, whether it is someone that people just are generally down on or a guy that can go in and based on previous production, um, really take that up a notch and uh, be a difference maker for the Winnipeg Jets. No, two things. I think that both Nino Niederreiter and Vlad Nemesnikov are going to have big seasons. Now, we've talked about Nino being an automatic 20-goal guy, but the Jets didn't have him for that long, so I don't think he ever – he never went on one of those Nino hot streaks that Bruce Boudreaux told me about uh, the day that they acquired his services. Uh, this is a guy that's going to have a physical impact, and he's going to be – you know he could be in the 25-plus range depending on how the season goes for him. I also think it's a step forward for Morgan Barron this year, Huss. Uh, especially, you know, he started on the fourth line. If Morgan Barron can work his way into the third line before the year is over, I could see him being a, I think he could be Brandon Tanev type of impact offensively. He doesn't play the same style of game. It's more of a power forward game compared to the, you know, buzzsaw that Brandon Tanev was. But Brandon Tanev's best year, Huss, he had 14 goals for the Jets. I could easily see Barron being a 12 to 14 goal guy. Uh, outside of that on the back end, as I said before, I think Neil Pionk is bouncing back. Now, what that looks like in terms of offense, I'm not sure. But this is a guy who, you know, in my conversation with him in training camp, is a guy who's been really hard on himself. He knows that he hasn't played at the level he's, you know, expected of on that second pairing. And, you know, I think Dylan Sandberg is going to have a quiet, quietly Im- impactful season as well. Uh, he's not going to put up a ton of points, but I can see him moving into a top four role and really being a bit of a stabilizer uh, with the Hermantown connection there on the back end. So uh, those are some guys. And I think us, we talked about Alex I follow a lot. I think Alex, if he plays, you know, in the middle six and plays with Perfetti and Niederreiter, I think he could score 20, quite frankly. I think you can nar- mark him down in pen for 15, but he might be a 20-goal guy if he gets some extended playing time. You know, with that line, but also I think he'll help the third line with Adam Lowry have a little bit more of an offensive tilt to it, if you will. Well, he'll definitely need to get 20-plus if he's playing on that second line because that's going to be in Nikolai Ehlers' place, and that'll mean Ehlers is not there, and that's a big, well, big hole to fill. Well, down, too, with, with Lowry because we know those guys Oh, sorry, I just success. thought you meant, you know, if he's playing with with Niederreiter and Perfetti in that spot like, oh, he, no, was, like he was last night. Well, Ken, we were asking about a player that could be a difference maker, that could put the Jets over the top, you, my friend, are the player that helped put us over the top. It is official. Thank you to everyone. During our interview with Ken, we officially hit 10,000 subs. Top, top of the list. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Weber. Uh, a great hit with us as always uh we appreciate your contributions excited for your new home excited for the season and uh you know hopefully uh, the team can get a great uh, couple days in coming together a couple great days of practice and to get off to a great start on wednesday in calgary for the 2023 2024 season us the best news is that you didn't make me talk about vladi guerrero's base running blunders uh, for I, didn't the last half an hour I didn't even want to go good. there i didn't even want to go there mike mike vented big time yesterday <laughs> and i knew we had so much jet stuff to talk about but uh what but while you're here if you would like no, to no, pour good. a little dirt on the blue jays and your experience from uh, target field feel free no hated the decision to pull Barrios. Uh, he was dealing uh, i didn't like the base running the, the all of the Jays' woes were on full display for all to see. Us so, can't hit with runners in scoring position, can't run the bases, and even when the pitching was very good, you can't get the job done. So, really unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. But uh, love the experience, and shout out to the Twins fans. Uh, they were exceptional. The vibe at Target was incredible, and I'm really glad I made the trip. I mean, October baseball, there's not many things like it, Huss, and it's tremendous. So, hey. got to roll. Hey, just, roll. Just, the room's open. Did this, this, did, uh, did you have a? Uh, we had the incredible Ken Weeb GIF from earlier in WST history. Did you do that again when they yanked Barrios? Oh no, I had a full face palm for that one. That's <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. Enjoy it, man. Thanks for your time as always. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Have a great weekend here. Right Cheers. on, have Ken Weeb. You can check out all the uh, reporting in the free press. He's heading down to the room right now. Great to have Ken with us. Um, uh, listen, just see in the chat, everyone. Thank you guys so much uh, for the support. To uh, ever those last three subs were welcome aboard. Great to have you with us. And a shout out to Colorado Lowe's, 
with 10 gifted Winnipeg Sports Talk memberships for people in the chat. Um, ni- nice to get the good vibes going again just as we get into some bomber talk with Ed Tate in a few minutes. But, uh, Remo, the goal was next Wednesday, and the WSTers came through, and uh, we got her done on a Friday, a Marvel's Friday. I knew we were going to somehow inject the vibes, the positive vibes back into the program, despite a bit of an uh, ominous end of the preseason for the hockey club last night. Yeah, let's get the confetti going. Yes. Here it is. Um, yeah, I mean, this is pretty uh, incredible. Wanted to get to 10K. I went hard in September, posting a lot of videos, and I guess it paid off here. So uh, thanks, everyone, who's found us new. You're an original. Uh, this is uh, so great to be able to come here every day and talk, uh, you know, Winnipeg sports. And here we are, 10Ks. I mean, it's, what does it mean? It doesn't, it's just vanity. It doesn't really mean much, but it's kind of, it's uh, quite an accomplishment what we've done here and you know almost three years now which is hard to believe so this, this is awesome uh great and i showed it to T. and Polly uh with one of the that one of the first subs here with the super chat uh i love seeing him here every day yeah T. and Polly, congrats wst from the og first ever sub or at least top 10 lol absolutely and uh listen thank you very much for the super chat Polly. and, and listen you know speaking of T. Kona, um there are so many of you uh, way too many to name all of you, but I mean, one of the things that has made this channel grow the way that it has um, and take off is the community that's been created in the chat. And I always give Remus credit. I mean, when we were planning on doing this originally, we were going to essentially, you know, bang out a couple hours of content very similarly to what we did um, back on the old station. And he was like, well, if we're doing it anyways, we may as well do it on YouTube. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I mean, I had no idea whether people would even care about watching the live show or any part of that. And um, and it has taken on a whole life of its own. So um, to all of you, we appreciate it. And especially the ones that have been with us from March of 2021 and April of 2021 and contributing every single day with us live on YouTube. And listen, for everyone listening on the podcast, it is a huge part of what we're doing as well. And we appreciate the downloads and you're listening to us when it's convenient for you afterwards. Um, But if you ever get a chance, you're off a day or your schedule is a little different, jump on in uh, because the real fun's happening on the YouTube channel with uh, everybody in chat having a blast. Uh, We've got some more super chats coming in. There's our guy, Elliot. What is up, Elliot? Tuning in from Vancouver, representing at BC Place tonight. That's what I'm talking about, E. Congrats on 10K. Celebrating out here with plenty of cold beers and BC bud in anticipation for a huge <laughs> bomber game. Let's go. <laughs> that, that's the super chat of the day, Elliot. Have an awesome time tonight. Um, and we got another one nicely from Derek Schmidt. Great to see Derek at the game last night. 10 bucks for 10K subs. Appreciate that very greatly. And uh, Ken007, the $20 super chat as well, guys. Uh, uh, guys and gals, um, we, uh, we, we, well, needless to say, we obviously wouldn't be here without you. And of course, a big thanks to our sponsors who have been with us from uh, from day one. Um, and so many of us, basically, so many of them staying on from when they got in initially on a short term uh, have had great feedback and have stayed with us through. Uh, through this entire run. So 10 K down. Now, uh, I guess we're on our way to 15 next and then 20 and then 25. Uh, it's certainly not going to stop. And we are not stopping here on Winnipeg sports talk. Um, but Remo, uh, listen, I, this is a perfect time for this to happen at the start. And I didn't say, Hey, everyone sub, sub, sub. Yeah, you did. You didn't. Be- I didn't mention it once. Uh, it was all the people in the chat that were doing it. And again, that's the sort of support we get. Because I kind of maybe didn't want to pop the confetti and everything as we got into the show. Because let's face it, the preseason ended on a big time downer last night. Uh, I know everyone's feeling bad for Billy Hainala. Everyone a little concerned about what we saw from the hockey club. But the timing of this is absolutely perfect because the vibes are high once again in the WST chat. And uh, we got a big, big football game to talk about with Eddie Tate when he joins us in just a few minutes from BC. Yeah, this is uh, awesome. Uh, look at all the super chats coming in. Derek W's, congrats on 10K. Johnny Bird, first ever super chat. What up, Johnny? Happy for 10K. Happy, happy local sports is back. 10007, thank you. 
with a very generous super chat as well. And Andrew Haleko just pops one in. Yay, day one here. Uh, I realize that my the sum of my collective marble race finishes is greater than 10,000. 10, we have done a lot of marble races. No doubt about it. And you know what? I just want to make a quick mention on the uh, the memberships. And uh, shout out to Colorado Lowe's who gifted uh, 10 memberships. This is not something we talk about a lot, but it was a way for people that wanted to support the channel right off the bat with... Um, what is it? It's $2 um, a, a month. And you'll see folks like T. Will and Elliot with the microphones. Uh, there's some special emojis and stuff like that. Um, so listen, I mean, that's just a way for people to support the channel. But we do occasionally have things that come up. Like last night, we had a pair of tickets to the game. And um, Remo fired a, an email out to all the uh, all the members, and um, somebody was able to take them up up on that and do it. So uh, if you're uh, if you're thinking about a way to, to to support the channel or want to get in and get a chance on some of those other things for the people that have meant so much to us and supported us so well, um, be uh, become a member, get that cool mic, get all the uh, the fun in the chat as well, um, and it all goes to uh, help us do what we do every day here on WST. So uh, thank you again. And all you new members, courtesy of Colorado Lowe's, shout him, a, shout him out a thanks in the chat. All right. Um, well, we're going to get to uh, some football talk right away because we got a big one tonight. Before we bring in Eddie Tate, um, I do want to thank the Jets for a great day uh, yesterday beforehand. And we'll uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more. we got a big tour of the... Um, uh, new areas in the arena, got to try some of the new food. Um, and then we got out to the uh, the hangar bar, which is right outside of our section for our four-game pack. Um, they've done some neat things to it. It looked great. Um, so we can't wait. If, if you've been thinking about it, check out our website. If you're on the podcast, go to winnipegsportstalk.com. If you're with us on YouTube, click that first link to find out more and uh, get the four-game pack. We filled the seats in Section 316. We've got a couple rows, some remaining seats across the aisle in 317. We'll be getting together before the game's in that bar right outside our section. We'll do a couple giveaways, um, and everyone's going to get a free drink or a beer, soda or pop with uh, each uh, for each game that they buy. So uh, join us. So we've had a great, great response, and uh, the WST crew keeps on growing. And a uh, shout-out to everyone that's jumped on that already. And don't forget, home opener a week from tomorrow, 3 p.m. Get your tickets for that one and join everyone at the party in the plaza, which should be a lot of fun from noon until 2.30 before the opening game of the year. Um, hey, I've got to give a shout out to Vita Health Fresh Market. If you're looking for great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, you need to get on down to one of six Vita Health Fresh Market stores or online at myvita.ca. Of course, online delivery is available and you can shop at myvita.ca. And right now, you'll get a free gift when you place an order for $100 or more at myvita.ca. And again, when you're Shopping at Vita Health, you're supporting a great local company, family owned and operated since 1936 with Winnipeg's largest assortment of local products too. Vita Health, empowering people to lead healthy lives, six Winnipeg locations and online at myvita.ca. Um, we know Wallace and Wallace are the fencing experts in town. They've been with us for years. They've been doing it for Winnipegers since 1946. What you might not know is they're the overhead door experts as well. And that overhead garage door has had lots of ups and downs this summer, working hard to get you to and from all your summer fun. Well, it's about to get a whole work a whole lot harder because winter puts much more stress on a garage door. The right time to prevent downtime this winter is now. Call Wallace & Wallace to book your inspection and maintenance service call today for residential and commercial overhead door sales and service. There's only one name or two you need to know, and that is Wallace and & Wallace. And hey, with the big celebration today, I know we've been delinquent with our suit shows, but uh, we're going to need to show off the goods from F Apparel, I think, next week for a big 10K. Of course, if you need to up your menswear game heading into the new season, get on down to F Apparel. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. 10% or sorry, 15% discount for wedding parties. So if you're getting married or in a wedding party, 
talk to the fellas about a 15% discount when the wedding party gets their suits from F Apparel. Pop by and see them at 190 Smith Street downtown or make an appointment at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. Um, big, uh, just shout out, Chickster, another super chat. You can take my time, you just take my money. Congrats on 10K. Go Jets, go Bombers, and go Aussie Rules. Chickster's our uh, resident um, our resident Aussie rules uh, expert. And uh, Kevin Berg, welcome to the crew. Great to have you on board as a member. Spency with the super chat. Choo choo, can't stop the hype train. And uh, of course, Ken007. Well, let's uh, continue the positive vibes right into nine o'clock tonight in BC and welcome in our pal Ed Tate from the Winnipeg Football Club, who's in BC getting ready for this monster tilt tonight. Eddie, you joined us at a good time. The show started on a bit of a downer. Everyone was upset about Billy Hanley getting injured last night and the way the Jets preseason ended. But we got through it. We just hit 10,000 subs, which was a big goal of ours. And now we can put all of this positivity into the biggest game of the year as the Bombers take on the BC Lions. What's the vibe around the club as we get ready for kickoff tonight? I would say it's kind of quiet to be honest us uh some of these road trips uh you see you see guys at breakfast you see them wandering around the hotel i think this is a pretty focused bunch right now and that's not surprising uh you know you hate to use the cliche that this is just another business trip because it sure doesn't feel like it with so much on the line but uh i don't know i, I get the sense that it's been a good practice week and they're pretty uh, amped up for this one should be fun i know that there's a buzz here in bc and there's been a lot of years when we'd come out here to Vancouver where the Lions are, were kind of forgotten on the sporting landscape here. But Amar Doman, the, the owner here, has done a great job. They're calling it the Gravy Bowl tonight because it's uh, on Thanksgiving weekend. They'll be, you know, they'll be serving turkey tortillas or something in the warm-up. They've got the University of Washington mar- marching band coming in for this one. I think the lower bowl is, is sold out. They've opened up some seats for the upper deck. So... It's starting to feel like a football town again, which is uh, pretty important for this league. Well, no, listen, I mean, aside from tonight's game, I mean, the development of what's happened under Amar Dolman over the last couple of years has been uh, a great to see, very important for the Canadian Football League. And part of the success, I think, of the club has been that they got a pretty damn good football team. And uh, this is a, a matchup that, to be honest, Ed, I think – Ever since the Lions came in and waxed the Bombers earlier in the season and a bit of a wake-up call, I think, for the team, but also for everybody, the Bombers returned the favor. We knew that the West, in all likelihood, was coming down to October 6th at BC Place, and that is exactly the way everything has played out. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because last year, uh, the gap between these two clubs uh, narrowed considerably, and a lot of that had to do with Nathan Wark, but they have a good football team out here last year too. So when Nathan Wark left, a lot of people thought the Lions might take a step back, but they're right there again. Vernon Adams is having a great year. Uh, and so you do have to give a, a lot of credit to them, and it's 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 going to be fun tonight. It's it's it. We've had this one circled for a while, but I had last week's game circled for a while too. And then the the you know the Argos went ahead and clinched first place with like two months before the end of the season, and they decided to rest some people last week, and that kind of was a bit of a buzzkill about that game. There's no lack of uh, excitement for this one. There is no buzzkill this week. Everybody's pretty jacked up for this one across the league, and I I think it's going to make for a pretty compelling game tonight. I'll tell you what's unbelievable, Ed. Professional football the grind that both of these teams have been under through 14 games of the regular season. And we're getting a matchup of two almost completely healthy teams. Yep. It's really like, and from a Bombers perspective, uh, there was only one lineup change again, and that's Janarian Grant coming back, which is massive. But Demario Houston, uh, he got hurt last week, but he's only been put on the one game injured list. So we're hopeful that he could be back soon. But you're right. Both teams are ridiculously uh, healthy, and you know uh, you you hope that that can continue into the playoffs. But um, you know there's going to be no asterisks besides this one tonight. It's the full lineup. Remember the Bombers came in here at the end of last year and they already clinched first place and rent, rested a bunch of people. Drew Brown started the game, and uh, you know so it was a hard game to get a read on. Well, not this one. It's full bore. Both teams going at it and. Uh, you know, I know that the Lions want to take down the the West Division champions, and I I get the sense that they're pretty jacked up. 
uh, you know, I'm not I'm not uh, predicting doom and gloom here, but let's remember if uh, whoever loses tonight, they're not eliminated, right? This isn't the uh, this isn't the West Final, so these two teams should meet again. I would expect, unless there's a massive upset in the West semifinal. So this is just like. Uh, you know, the Ali, and I'm dating myself here, but the Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier fights that they fought two, two three times. I think this is like the, the the middle fight between these teams because we're, I'm certain that they're going to meet again. Well, I, I, I too, but I mean, I, I think we <laughs> can't overstate the importance oh, absolutely. of what a win tonight <laughs> means because while they probably will see um, these opponents again later on this season, um, we know what IG Field is like in the playoffs. We know what the weather is like in November. And uh, as someone that wants to see the Bombers get back to the Grey Cup, I have a far greater level of confidence in the Bombers at home in front of a packed IG Field with that crowd behind them in the middle of November with a team that normally plays in a dome on the West Coast coming to the Prairies at that time of year than the Bombers having to go back to BC Place where this game will be tonight. So... Um, there really is a lot on the line. And, and never mind where the game is played, just the fact that there's a buy built in in that, Ed, the extra preparation time, and good teams with good coaching staffs like both of these teams have take advantage of that. And uh, the numbers dictate that if you're playing at home in that final, seven plus times out of ten, you're representing your division in the Grey Cup. Well, that's it. So tonight's game is to have that home field advantage, basically, right? So... Uh, and I, you're right. I think home field advantage matters more in Winnipeg than it does for BC. So here's, I mean, I'm just uh, parroting what you just said, Hus. But BC coming to Winnipeg in in uh, early November, where it could be nasty, it, and it might not be, but it's likely going to be cold and chilly, and they're a dome team, like you said. You just, I, I don't know how you get prepared for that unless you practice in Winnipeg for a couple of weeks, which they're not going to do. The Bombers get hardened to those conditions, and I think that's we've seen that in the last couple of West Finals. On the other hand, what does home field advantage mean to the Lions? Well, it means that they get to play in the Dome, and they'll have their crowd in front of them. But it doesn't scare me if you're a Bomber and you have to come in here to play a West Final because uh, you get to showcase your skill, too, on a, where weather isn't a factor. You, you made the key point. It's that you've got to get by somebody first to get to that game. And, you know, whether it's Saskatchewan or whoever it might be in the West semifinal, who knows what your roster looks like coming out of that game because it would be a dogfight too. So that's the key is it's not just the uh, home field advantage. It's the week off. And uh, the fact that home field advantage, I think, matters more in Winnipeg and Saskatchewan than anywhere else in this league, not just because of the crowd, but because of the weather in November. Hey, uh, just a quick shout out to Lauren Findlay in chat. Lauren, thank you very much for those five gifted subs. And uh, Rook of the Year, Gitch Lishka, Amy Wee, Peppermint Patty, EK Posty, all fire out a thanks to Lauren because uh, you guys got those gifted memberships. And uh, thanks again uh, on that uh, super chat for uh, for Schickster. Um, Ed, what was it like? I mean, you're around the team every day. God knows we've been talking about the return game and when is Janarian going to be back? Um, he practiced all week. How did he look? And um, what sort of a uh, boost does that give the Winnipeg Blue Bombers going into uh, this game for uh, with so much on the line? Well, the funny thing about when you get a kick returner back at practice is that you pra they practice kick returns, but there's no tackling, right? So they uh, they line up, they kick the ball and down the field, Janarian uh, catches it and takes a few steps here and there, and uh, that's about it, right? So you can't really get a read on how sharp he is, but there's kind of an emotional lift getting him back. You don't know how many times, and it's not a slight of Jamal Parker or Greg McRae, but you know, you'd be during a practice week and you hear you talk to a player in the in the locker room and they'd say, man, we need we need J.G. back, Janarian Grant. We need J.G. back. We need J.G. back because he's instant field position. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping people don't have these enormous expectations that he's going to take like three to the house tonight. But I think he's can, he's just going to flip the field and he's going to catch the ball. And he's going to as, as Mike O'Shea said yesterday, I thought it was a great quote. The thing that the team appreciates the most about Janarian Grant is that if on a certain return there's three yards there, he's going to get the three yards. If the return is set up that the max he could get would be 17 yards, he's going to get the 17 yards. That's how he plays, and I think the players feed off that. And remember last year, too, and this, the, the Bombers came into BC in that big game last July. He returned the opening kickoff 
for a touchdown. He did it in the West final. He returned a punt against BC for a touchdown. He's a game changer, and there's a lot of good returners in this league, but I don't think there's anybody as good as Janarian Grant. Um, Ed with us, Ed Tate with us before uh, tonight's 9 o'clock start. Eddie, I have full confidence in the Bomber offense. Uh, I think that they're going to get theirs. I mean, with the way Brady Oliveira is playing, Zach Caleros, that receiving core, I think they're going to score. To me, this game is going to rely on the performance of the defense for a full 60 minutes. I mean, we have seen them look at their championship level at times this year. At times we haven't. Sometimes it's taken a little longer to uh, to get in. Um, do you sort of share that in, in a lot of ways the path to victory is one of the biggest performances of the year from the Bomber defense and, and a good start for that defense as well at the same time? Yeah, no question. It's been, you know, you look at that game last week, Huston, that's the uh, – Argos score on their first two possessions, and then the Bombers settle in and, and on defense and on defense and get things uh, straightened out. I don't think you can you can give yourself that kind of uh, leeway tonight against BC. You can't uh, gift them a couple of touchdowns on their first two possessions, and then okay, well now we're going to be okay because that might be too late by then. There's an awful lot of skill on this BC offense. I agree with you. Winnipeg's offense is stacked, and if they can find some consistency, they'll put up they should put up 30 points on anybody. Uh, but if Winnipeg's defense can find that other gear, you know, I talked to Willie Jefferson this week. It's still bugging him that he hasn't had a sack in like eight games. You know, you've got a change at corner with Jamal Parker coming in. You know that BC is going to test him, uh, you know, and then you just, you want that game where all of a sudden Vernon Adams doesn't have any time where he doesn't look comfortable, where he's, he's on his back a lot, where they take away the run game, where they're turning the ball over. I think Winnipeg's defense still has that in them. It was just that, as you said, Huss, we haven't seen it for a consistent 60 minutes. And, uh, you know, this is prime time to get one again, get to get that defense to find that extra gear again. Um, uh, who uh, Who's in uh, for Demario Houston and uh, how uh, how does that change things, if at all? Yeah, so it's it's Jamal Parker. He'll play at the corner, but he's the guy that came in last week. The, the interesting thing is if you look at their depth chart this week, and I'm taking a look at it right now as we speak, uh, they didn't dress an extra defensive back, which I thought they might. So they've got the three safeties, uh, two backups behind Brandon Alexander and, and Nick Hallett and Jake Kelly, the rookie. And then it's Rose and Parker at the corners and Dietrich Nichols and Evan Holm at halfback. I suppose they could also uh, drop somebody back into coverage if like Retta Cramdy or Kerfala Exume could play defensive back if they had an injury. But I thought they might add another DB there because Parker – is making his first start of the year. I had a good chat with him this week. He's a neat guy. He, you know, he started a few games with this team last year. And this is a guy, and this is a classic CFL story. You know, sometimes we forget the road that these guys take to get here. So he started in the Grey Cup last year. But, you know, he played at Kent State. The COVID season comes along, or the COVID year comes out, around and shuts down everything. He doesn't get a pro day anywhere. He doesn't get a workout anywhere. He's working for DoorDash when the Bombers call three days into Bomber camp last year and say, hey, do you want to play football? And here we are now, and he's starting this. He started in the Grey Cup last year, and now he's starting in this game for first place. So it's a long way from delivering pizzas uh, wherever he was. I think he was in Philadelphia. So I, I love those kind of CFL stories. It's what makes this league special. No doubt about it. And what a great opportunity he has to make an impact. I um, um, think Evan Holm, a huge, huge guy tonight. He's a, he has had such a good season. I mean, he I don't know what people's expectations were for him, but he was he was noticeable right from the start of the year, Ed, and his confidence seems to have grown. And um, listen, I, I, of all the players – you know, outside of the the mainstays, the Willie and Biggie and uh, Jackson Jeffcoat, to me, Evan Holmes been a difference maker. And I think with the way the BC Lions plays, he's going to be right in the middle of it tonight. Yeah, it's. I think he's had an all star year, and I don't think that I'm being too hyperbolic here. And you know, a lot of the guys on TSN too have been and praising him this year. Glenn Suter, who played a defensive back in this league, has talked about Evan Holm. And Mike O'Shea said this year in training camp, he looks quicker. And I, you could notice it right away. And one of the things that you hope that you don't see too much tonight is his recovery speed. So uh, if he gets beat on a route and has to close to get back to a guy, he has great recovery speed. Let's hope we don't have to see that, that he's in full chase mode too much tonight. But uh, he's become a real special player. You know, sometimes they always talk about guys in their second year take that next step. Man, he's taken a couple of steps this year. He, he was a good player last year. He's having a great season this year. No doubt about it. Ed Tate's with us. What time did you guys get in yesterday? Uh, 
we had our media here at well, 515 Winnipeg time, 530 Winnipeg time. Um, so I, I just got to ask you, because this is the one time they're playing in BC this year. It's a 9 p.m. local start. You get there yesterday. What um, What's the schedule for the team today? Like, what's been going on? I mean, it's just past noon there. Um, fill us in on what goes into, like, the, this game day schedule of the Bombers um, for what would be on their body clocks a game that starts at 9 p.m. Winnipeg time. Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of people, that, lots of people that have traveled or have been to the West Coast, you know how the time change can affect you. The tip that most people get is that when you get here, so uh, we went out for dinner last night, and it was 9.30 Winnipeg time. So that, like your clock's all messed up already, right? At least for me, I'm old, but I don't eat uh, that late usually. Uh, and uh, so they say to stay out as late as you can, which is not a trouble for me on the road. I like to find a place that might serve maybe a beer or two. So we went to a couple of places like that. But I, like a lot of guys, we went for breakfast this morning. Uh, breakfast went from 9 to 11, and it was it was pretty packed already in the morning. And a lot of guys usually go, you know, if, if the window is nine to 11, you see it's pretty busy at 10 30 quarter to 11. But this morning I, I was talking to a few guys. It's like, I woke up at five o'clock. I couldn't go back to sleep because it's seven o'clock Winnipeg time. Right. And so I do think it plays with your head a little bit, but um, I guess it's, uh, you know, it's just those natural endorphins or whatever that get you fired up. The team will, the first bus goes to the stadium at three 45 and then the second bus goes an hour later. So there's going to be some guys that are just can't wait to get on that first bus. So they'll get to the stadium, get taped, whatever they do. Uh, and then they're just, if, if you get to the stadium that early, and I often do, you just watch and there's guys that come out and they just walk around the stadium. They walk around the field for half hour in their gear and then they go back in, or in their t-shirt and shorts. Then they go back in and change and come out again. It's a long day to wait to your point. And, uh, but, you know, that can be a good thing. But this isn't, like we said earlier, this isn't the game in July. This is for first place. So I think a lot of guys uh, don't mind having that time to kill because when uh, they put the ball on the tee tonight, they'll be pretty ready to go. Well, Eddie, I cannot wait for this one tonight. I have uh, I have an early, early start tomorrow morning to get out to Mini for that Chiefs-Bikes game. But okay. um, I'll tell you what, let's uh, let's start this weekend off right with a win, and uh, we can start making plans uh, tentatively for the 11th of November and a, a big West final once again at IG Field. Uh, good luck to the squad tonight. Thanks so much for the time, as always, Ed. We really appreciate it. Appreciate you, Hust. Congrats on uh, 10K subscribers, and I do a side bet with you on the Vikings uh, Chiefs, but I have no faith in my Vikings right now. i got to be honest. That one scares me tomorrow, so have fun at that one too, buddy. Thanks so much. We'll uh, talk to you soon. There's Ed Tate. Uh, Of course, you can uh, go to bluebombers.com for a full game preview and much more on tonight's game, and I know Eddie will be jumping on the uh, OB pregame show at some point with uh, Doug and DT and the rest of the crew. That And they're starting early today, uh, as Derek mentioned earlier today on the program. A 6.30 start so a full two and a half hours of pregame coverage for before the Winnipeg Blue Bombers game. Uh, again, big thanks to everybody in the chat with the support. Um, we're going to get to a little bit of NFL talk uh, with the hacksaw coming up right away. But uh, Remo, I, I was just kind of following on the chat and looking on the uh, on the feed. I guess we've got some clarity as to uh, the injury to Billy Hanela from last night uh, after practice today. Yes, has um sorry caught me mid chewing. Mike McIntyre tweeting out <laughs> Well I gotta eat lunch. This is the time I eat lunch. <laughs> I would just had just take a bite. Back to, back to the back to the back to the in, uh, injury. Yeah, I'll shut up. Um Rick Bonus says uh, Billy Hanala, fractured ankle. Next steps to be determined. Minimum of eight weeks, could be as many as twelve. Uh, that's Mike McIntyre tweeting that out from Rick Bonus, and Coach Rick Bonus says surgery is a possibility for Billy Hano. They're going to send him home to Finland to be with family for the next little while. He will return to Winnipeg as he gets closer to a, p- a potential return. So, and Nate Schmidt called what happened to teammate Billy Hano a shit burger, for lack of a better term. <laughs> 
Oh, man, that sucks. Um, but as I say, uh, you know, and maybe with the fracture, you know, a very clear line of recovery as opposed to the uncertainty of the high ankle sprain. But uh, nevertheless, um, devastating for a young man that had done everything he could to be on the team and be in that opening day lineup. But maybe that'll be a Christmas present for Winnipeg Jet fans based on the timeline the return of Villy, if we're looking at eight weeks to 12 weeks, maybe sometime in December. So uh, the young Finn can come gift wrapped and uh, hopefully get back and uh, pick up where he left off before getting hurt last night in the game. All right. Um, I do have a special. We just talked with about Bombers. I did cook up a special WST parlay for the game tonight. We'll get to that in the cool bet lines a little bit later on. But uh, we are going to pivot and talk a little NFL with our weekly NFL notebook with uh, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. But thanks again to Ed Tate for jumping on board today with a great Bomber report before the big one tonight. All our Bomber reports brought to you by Princess Auto, where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is over at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them on Panet Road or Portage Avenue West locations. And you can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. And don't forget... Princess Auto Tailgate Zone opens two hours before every Blue Bomber game. Uh, I know the Consolidated Supply fellas are going to be in front of a TV at 9 p.m. Big, big Bomber supporters are Joe and Spicy and the gang there. Uh, but they're also the leaders in irrigation systems, artificial turf, golf carts as the exclusive club car dealer in Manitoba and have other great options for your property, including hot tubs and amazing outdoor kitchens. And of course, they're also the leaders in small engine parts and repair. Pop by and see them at the showroom, open to the public, 1395 Niaqua Road East, or find out more online at cte.ca. Um, listen, whether you're thinking about this Chiefs-Vikings game on the weekend, the Bombers tonight, the start of the Jet season, if you're looking for the best in merchandise for your favorite team, there's only one place to go, and that, of course, is Royal Sports. Thousands of pieces of Jets gear, tons of exclusives. Same goes for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. All 32 NFL teams represented. And, of course, with hockey season here, you know Royal Sports is the original hockey superstore in Winnipeg, family-owned and operated for over 40 years. Pop by and see them at 750 Pemina Highway and follow them on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina. And listen, I could say this about Saturday, Sunday and the big NFL day, but before we even get there, it's a big one tonight. If you're thinking about a spot to get out and watch the game with your crew, no better than your no better place than your local Boston pizza. The big game on all the screens, big sound as well. And maybe the best part, the ice cold schooners, the world famous BP wings, the gourmet pizzas, the latest from the BP feature menu. Head on down tonight, 9 p.m. kickoff. And uh, just at the time, happy hours getting back in. And of course, if you are staying at home to watch the game tonight, you can get the great taste of Boston pizza delivered at bostonpizza.com. All right. Let's uh, get to it. Big NFL weekend coming up. And Lee Hacksaw Hamilton joins us now. Saw, what's going on? How are, how are you? Hustler, nice to hear from you. How you doing? Well, we're doing well. Big day today. We just hit 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. It was a big goal of ours. It's a big party in the chat right now. And I'll tell you what, I mean, I know you pay attention to the Canadian Football League. We got a massive tilt tonight with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and BC Lions, both at 10 and 4 playing for what will in all likelihood be the West final on home field. Um, one point spread right now. I mean, the two best teams in the West, it's going to be a, a great way to kick off the weekend. And then of course we get into a little college ball tomorrow and a big, big NFL Sunday. Well, you got, you got a uh, blue bombers team. It's pretty good. You got a BC lions team. It's kind of rallying back, but you know, across the province you got to deal with the Argonauts and Chad Kelly sometime someplace around Thanksgiving so you got some big games to be played and obviously a great cup game that carries tremendous importance hey listen before we get to Sunday um yesterday the Bears got off the mat and uh, put up 40 on the commanders and I guess if there was ever a time for that Chicago team to show up it was on a day that Bears legend Dick Butkus passed away. I'm not sure whether those guys would have been even allowed back into the state of Illinois if they had looked like they had the last little bit. But uh, a, a pretty impressive performance by Justin Fields. DJ Moore exploding last night. And 
listen, that Bears fan base had been through a lot. It had been a long time since they just won a game. Um, what did you think of last night and Justin Fields finally getting a W? Well, I'm on the road. I'm at my cottage way up in the northern Adirondacks, and I will tell you, I didn't, I didn't get access to watch the Thursday game, but every time I checked my cell phone, couldn't believe the score. Says something wrong with my phone, something wrong with the scoreboard. Is that Chicago Bear football? They jumped out to that huge lead against Washington. Justin Fields was red hot, 280 through the air, through four touchdown passes. D.J. Moore, the wide receiver, the ex-Carolina guy, caught, what, eight for 230 yards, a couple of bombs. Uh, my only concern about Chicago is the real protection packages against really good teams. Is that quarterback going to get busted up again? Because he, he can throw it if he has time. He tends to run a little bit too much for me, and then he gets dinged, and he's not the same guy. They don't have a ton of players on that roster. I was surprised they ambushed Washington. Washington just did not look like they played with any intensity at all because he ran up that score against what's supposed to be a pretty good commander's defense. And I'll tell you, a poor quarterback in Washington, Sam Howell, he got sacked five more times. He's been sacked 29 times in five games this season. And they're really deficient offensively at wide receiver. They're deficient. They have no running game. That quarterback's going to wind up in the hospital unless Ron Rivera can fix the protection packages. But I was impressed. Give Justin Fields credit. I mean, they got themselves finally into the victory column because a lot of people start to think maybe he's not the guy. And a lot of people don't think they have enough players on the roster yet. Still a lot of games to be played. But, yeah, that was a surprise. Yeah, and a shocking performance for the Commanders. You went toe-to-toe with the defending NFC champs last week at the Lincoln Philly come back home on a short week and, um, I mean, just got barnstormed by an 0-4 team. Not a lot of people saw that coming. Um, Lee, we're now through four weeks. A couple of key players that were on the pup list are coming back. What are you hearing about Cooper Cup, who we know is going to play if he's able to go, but I'm maybe more interested in Jonathan Taylor's situation with the Indianapolis Colts, considering the contract issues, and the fact that they basically told him to beat it for the first four weeks, and they've actually looked pretty competitive while he's been gone. Well, the Rams have been a bit of a surprise. I mean, they're sitting there at 2-2, two and two, and Matthew Stafford has really carried that thing, and he's been gunslinging, and they've got themselves a really bright young wide receiver uh, in Puka Tuka. Uh, I will say this, that the Cooper Cup's taken all the snaps with the first unit this week. But that being said, you know, he's injured that hamstring twice. And I'd be really concerned as to what is his durability factor. If he can come back without getting hurt again and retweaking the hamstring, then suddenly it adds a lot more zest to the Rams' offense. Uh, they think they got a running back for the future now in uh, Keon Williams, a second-year guy out of Notre Dame. He's had back-to-back-to-back pretty efficient games running the football. And as long as you got Aaron Donald on defense, you're, you're going to be okay. Uh, so, you know, we'll just cross our fingers because Cooper Cup is obviously a massive game changer. As to Indianapolis, uh, I guess one storyline is how vibrant Anthony Richardson has been at quarterback, the rookie from Florida. Now, he's been dinged twice in four weeks. I still think he runs the football way too much, but he is making plays down the field. Now you get Jonathan Taylor back. Taylor has shut his mouth. They have not solved the contract issue. We have till mid-October when the NFL trading deadline occurs. Maybe he'll still get moved, or maybe Taylor helps with Anthony Richardson and pushes this thing into maybe a wild-card playoff team, which I think would stun everybody in the National Football League. But Taylor has kept quiet about the contract dispute, the holdout, the, the rehab from the ankle surgery. The only time we'll tell what he's like when he gets activated, I think he probably will play. Now, whether or not he's in game shape to you know, play every snap on offense remains to be seen, but he'll be on the field this weekend in some form or fashion, and we'll see what the next three weeks brings us in terms of whether he stays in Indy to solve the contract dispute or he becomes trade bait to move somewhere else. Yeah, and of course, Zach Moss has had a great start to the season for Indy in his absence, so I think they realize they have a guy, and if there's an option for a trade, maybe they go that route. Lee, how uh, we got a few Bengals fans in the in the chat. How uh, close to hitting the panic button should people in the Natty be? Well, they're one and three, and Joe Burrow does not look like Joe Burrow because he can't move the pocket. You know, he tweaked that calf injury twice. Once in the beginning of preseason camp, he for, forced him out for five weeks. Didn't play any preseason games. Didn't look right. And then he tweaked it a second time. He's still playing. 
you know, my, my whole theory is he's such a value to the team. Are you better served to sit him a week or two, not allow him to possibly re-injure the calf again and get back to being what Joe Burrow is? Uh, either that or just run the ball a lot more with Joe Mixon. I mean, he's still got you know, two of the wide receivers, though T. Higgins is out with a fractured rib. So Cincinnati's season right now is, is bordering on going down the drain. I'm not going to say they mishandled Joe Burrow, but he's surely not the quarterback that we've seen lead the Bengals to great times last couple of years. So, yeah, their season's really in jeopardy, and he's in jeopardy. If if he's playing at 80%, he could re-injure that calf again, which I think would be a significant setback. Lee, uh, we've got the, I mean, in my opinion, maybe the best rivalry in the NFL over the last two decades coming up again this weekend, the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Baltimore Ravens. Um, I, I gave the Steelers a mulligan for the first couple weeks and Kenny Pickett. I mean, they were going up against arguably the two best defenses in football in San Francisco and Cleveland. But, man, you put up six points on the Houston Texans, who, to their own right, maybe you want to touch on how impressive they have been in rookie quarterback C.J. Stroud. But first off, the, the, the Steelers' situation coming into this game um, as pretty significant home underdogs to a Ravens team that sees themselves at the top of the uh, AFC North. Well, they are at the top of the AFC North, and Pittsburgh is at the bottom of the AFC North. Pittsburgh is pedestrian. Uh, you know, when you and I did our NFL preview package the first weekend in September, I just really expressed concern of, of what their offense was. There's not a lot of game breakers on the offense. I mean, they, they've got a lot of new pieces in the offensive front. Kenny Pickett is getting pounded. Uh, he threw for 114 yards last week and then got dinged. Uh, they got two running backs that are kind of pedestrian right now. They don't have what I think are legitimate game breakers because guys they had left as free agents or were told to leave. Defense can only carry you so long. I mean, I was shocked last week how bad it was considering who was on that side of that defensive ball led by T.J. Watt and his running mate at linebacker Highsmith. So Pittsburgh's got problems. There's enormous criticism of Matt Canada, the offensive coordinator. But, you know, he can only call plays for what they give him on the roster. I just don't think Pickett's got enough people around him. Now, maybe they'll get progressively better as they go, but there's just not, to me, it's just not the perfect mix in Pittsburgh. And Baltimore's Lamar Jackson, and they're going to get Odell Beckham back this week. Running game, obviously losing J.K. Dobbins is a big setback because they had such high hopes that they had every facet put together. Mark Andrews has been dinged at tight end. So I don't think we've seen the Ravens at full speed that they can be once they get everybody back healthy. But you know one thing about you play a Harbaugh team on a Sunday, you are going to get punched in the mouth. And Steelers going to have a real bad weekend unless, unless the 72,000 fans at Heinz Field can come on the field and play also with Pittsburgh. Steelers are in for a long, long season. Let's uh, get to uh, some of the marquee games on the uh, docket for this weekend. Uh, there is a few. Um, first off, a very interesting London game. The Jags have been there all week. They're playing back-to-back -back games in London, whereas the Bills, as far as we know, are just kind of leaving on Thursday, one day to acclimatize, or a couple days, I guess, and then go at it on Sunday. Um, is, this a sp is this a tough spot for the Buffalo Bills, despite how great they've looked the last few weeks? I think you're asking me the question, is this a trap game? I don't think so, because I don't think Jacksonville's got the kind of firepower to keep up with everything that Buffalo does. You know, and we haven't really talked about what happened last week up in Buffalo, uh, the, the the Bills' annihilation of, of Miami. And, you know, Buffalo scored six touchdowns and a field goal in the first eight possessions of that game. I never would have thought it would have been like that. And Josh Allen threw for 380 and four scores, and they were really revved up. To play two in Miami and two didn't do bad through for 280 but he had an interception a fumble he did get sacked four times well that Buffalo defense and that Bills quarterback Josh Allen they're going to be in London and I think it's going to be a really tough day for Trevor Lawrence because I just don't think from a talent standpoint they can match up Buffalo Buffalo is the real deal and they did get it cranked up last weekend and maybe they learned something about themselves that you can't take anybody lightly in the National Football League. So I think it's going to be a tough, tough weekend uh, in jolly old England for the Jaguars. What a Sunday nighter we've got on tap. Cowboys and Niners. And I was, think? Th I was thinking that this was going to be two undefeated teams going at it, but the Cardinals took care of that, handing the Cowboys their lone loss of the season. 
But on the other side, I mean, the Niners look uh, about as close to unstoppable as we have of a team in the NFL right now, led by Christian McCaffrey, who I think is very soon going to be rushing his way into the MVP conversation, Lee. Uh, what do you think about this Sunday nighter and where both teams are at heading into kickoff? Well, if you ever come up with an answer how Dallas could lose to Arizona, just just text me and give me the explanation because I can't figure that one out. That being said, uh, Dallas is going to get this thing jacked up. Uh, this is going to be an enormous game because not only have you got two mad scientists at quarterback and Kyle Shanahan and Mike McCarthy, not only do you have two pretty good quarterbacks, Brock Purdy, who's managing games, and Dak Prescott, who can win games, but you got tremendous speed at wide receiver on both teams against really quality defensive guys on both sides. And then you got the war in the trenches between a really good offensive line that Dallas has and a phenomenally fierce defensive front uh, that the 49ers bring to the line of scrimmage. You know, San Francisco is number two in the league in offense, 398 yards per game. They're number three in the league in defense. Dallas is number two in defense. Dallas has only given up 259 yards per game, Hustler. And Dallas has already got 10 takeaways in the first four weeks of the season. So this is going to be classic. Now, it's going to be it's going to be a different style game this week than we saw last week when we talked about Buffalo versus Miami. But it's marquee. And there's, there's not a lot of good games on, on the schedule. You're, you're not telling me that you're changing your weekend plans because you can't miss Denver and the Jets or Green Bay and the Raiders. Are you not telling me that, are you, pal? Well, I, I'm not, but that's because I'm going to be at the Chiefs-Vikings game. But before we get to that, I if I wasn't, I would make sure I was at a sports bar where I could watch both games at the same time because I, in fact, am fascinated by this Denver-Jets game especially considering what we saw from Zach Wilson finally on Sunday night football, despite ending up fumbling the game away uh, at the end. Um, and not to mention all the talking between these clubs that was started by Sean Payton in the preseason. This is an opportunity for Nathaniel Hackett and Zach Wilson to stick it to a team that by the numbers, Lee, has had the historically worst defense through four games in the modern era of the NFL. Um is this a get-right game for Denver, or are they on the verge of another massive embarrassment? I don't think it can afford to be an embarrassment because Denver did come back last week and beat Chicago, and they were in a massive trench, and they dug their way out of it. Now, Russell Wilson's playing pretty well under Sean Payton. Denver's got just a ton of injuries. You know, the Jets, Zach Wilson's got to prove it. he can do it on a week-by-week -week basis rather than regress back and turn it over and take sacks and fumble the football and throw picks. So... I'm reserving judgment, at least on the offensive side of the Jet football team. But defensively, Robert Saleh's got a, a fierce defensive front, and they're going to go after Russell Wilson. It's it's kind of odd. I, I think if, if there's disappointments around the NFL, Denver has to be one. We thought a great deal of Sean Payton going to the Mile High City and inheriting the quarterback. And, but you got so many guys hurt in camp, they, they've not had all their offensive players. So it'll be an okay game. But, uh, I mean, you can sit in a bar. They're going to, they'll do a split screen with you. You'll probably have a headache by the third quarter trying to watch two or three games simultaneously. But, hey, that's your prerogative to do it your way. But all my attention is going to be zeroed in on Kyle Shanahan versus Mike McCarthy. Great, great game. Well, I'm glad that that's the night game because we'll be rolling out of, uh, of uh, U.S. Bank Stadium, uh, finding somewhere to set uh, saddle up and uh, watch that one. Um, Vikes are one and three, but they've been really competitive in their three losses. Chiefs are three and one. And, you know, while they've, well, they've won their three games after that opening loss to Detroit, which they certainly could have won, um, it hasn't quite looked like the Super Bowl Chiefs right now. And a big part of that is, you know, after Travis Kelsey, no real receivers stepping up. Um, is, this a, is this a game that the Vikings might be able to potentially win, Lee? I mean, how do you see this one breaking down? And, uh, and where are you at on the Chiefs so far through, th through four? You're a closet Viking fan? Is that what you're telling me? Just There's a lot of them here. The There's a lot of them around here. Me, I mean, I got a soft spot for him in the NFC, but trust me, I'll be wearing red on Sunday. Uh, I, I think the Kansas City issue, uh, although Mahomes has taken a lot of it on himself, saying we're turning the ball over too much, I just don't think the wide receiver core has held up their end of the deal. Uh, I think in the first four weeks, the wide receivers, uh, Andrew, I think have 45 receptions and two touchdowns. 
that's a far cry from the era of Tyreek Hill and all the guys that used to be there. Uh, I, I think they run sloppy routes. They drop passes. Uh, they're awfully young. Sky Moore is a second-year guy out of Western Michigan who I really like. I think he's going to be a good player, but he's not there yet. Kadarius Tony should be better than he is now, considering he played a chunk for two years with the Giants. Didn't do anything in KC till the tail end of last season. So they're just, they're just not a complete team. And I think what we might see is they might go back to pounding the ball with Isaac Pacheco at running back. He went for a buck 15 last week. So if they can run him and he gets more productive with Mahomes, and maybe that means the wide receiver group will catch up. I'll, I'll throw this name out there. Uh, nobody wants to talk about it, but Eric Bieniemy was a hell of an assistant coach. And Eric Bieniemy, he coached those wide receivers and those skill players really hard in Kansas City. And I don't see the same discipline. I don't see the same attention to detail from the whole collection of wide receiver groups. And Kelsey, he can't do it by himself. Yeah, he can catch passes. Will he bust some touchdowns? Yeah, but he's not going to catch 10 to 12 passes and score three touchdowns every Sunday. That's just not in him. So I just don't think KC right now, the wide receiver group is the same. And Mahomes has beaten himself up publicly. He's kind of shielding the wide receiver group. Andy Reid's got to figure this thing out. Because if these guys can't up their game, then Mahomes is going to be asked to do too much. And then that leads to other problems, even though they're not in what I'd call a very strong division. I thought that we might see a similar deal. I and mean, we recall last year when Kadarius Tony was on the outs with the Giants, he ended up in Kansas City. I thought Brett Veach might be sniffing around Chase Claypool, but apparently today Claypool's been traded to the Dolphins of all teams that already have Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. Yeah, that was kind of a surprise. But Claypool, you know, he, he yapped his way out of Pittsburgh. And Chicago, the, this was a weird trade. They traded a second round pick to get him, and then he became a problem in Chicago. And they said, here's your bag, leave Soldier Field. And all they got was a sixth-round pick. They got a little salary cap relief in the deal. I'm surprised, like you, that Claypool wound up going to Miami, but maybe he's an insurance policy guy. And, you know, if you can't play for Mike Tomlin or Mike Tomlin wants you to leave, and he did have a good year and a half, and I thought star on the horizon has not happened. So we'll see. But maybe if somebody gets dinged in Miami, then he becomes a, a key part of, of the Dolphin offense, but at this point, he's got a job right now because the last team didn't want him and the team before that let him go. Now, Hacksaw, anyone that has been uh, wise enough to hit up Lee Hacksaw Hamilton knows that you're not only our go-to guy for NFL, but a true sports renaissance man paying attention to everything. I can't have you on this week without talking quickly about the Major League Baseball playoffs. And, dude, people north of the border are still apoplectic about the Jays' collapse and yanking Barrios, who was dealing after 47 pitches, it ended up coming down to this team just simply could not hit in the clutch. But did you catch any of that? What was your reaction when they went to pull Barrios in the top of the fourth inning with the way he was pitching? And um, how, from your, from way outside the market with no skin in the game, how disappointing is another two and out playoff visit for the Toronto Blue Jays? Well, the whole world went two and out this past week. Every yeah. one of those wild card series were lose one, lose two. Toronto, is, to me, has been an enigma. I mean, they got all these bats in the lineup, and you would thought they'd beat the hell out of everybody they played. They didn't. They were so erratic. You know, I, I stood there, and I watched Guerrero stand on the base path and get picked off second base, and I shook my head. You know, where's your focus? Where's your intensity? How could you do that? And obviously, pulling Berrios was a bit of a shocker to me, because you can't, you can't protect a starting pitcher. you got to have him go as far as he can go, because if you lose that first wild card game, A, you might not get a chance to climb back in the series, and it won't be a second series for Berrios to pitch. So I was stunned there. And, of course, they had some injuries to their staff along the way. So I was shocked there. Not so much uh, shocked in Tampa, because I thought Tampa was living on borrowed time. You know, they won 99 games. And they, they fought through a lot of injuries, and they still got 99 wins, but they were fatigued and shot by the time they got uh, to their playoff series, and they got taken out too straight. And the other thing in, T in Tampa, you know, there's a great dialogue about we're building this brand-new stadium. We are going to make this franchise a success on the Sun Coast. They had the two worst home playoff crowds in the history of baseball. 
going back to the 1919 Black Sox scandal with the Cincinnati Reds. Think about that. In modern-day baseball, to draw 19,000 and 20,000, you have two playoff games for a team that just won 99. they got to be sick to their stomach. And, of course, I can identify with failure because we got a $253 million team in San Diego that did not even make the playoffs. So we've all turned our attention to the North, and you got the Dodgers starting their National League playoff series with Arizona, and then you got home run derby. Do not miss it. And by the way, bring a batting helmet so you don't get hit by any fly balls. <laughs> Braves and Phillies is just going to be something. And of course, you got the Houston Cheats against the Minnesota Twins, who somehow got their way into the series too. So yeah, first week, first wild card weekend was really strange, and now we're starting to play real baseball, and there's some great series. Pushing ahead. So, yes, Lee, we had a big day today. We finally hit uh, our uh, goal of 10,000 subs on YouTube. Everyone that's with us, get on over and check out what Hacksaw's doing on YouTube and give him a sub over there as well. And uh, tee up um, everything that you've got going on at Lee Hacksaw Hamilton heading into another huge sports weekend. Well, NFL teams have begun their bye weeks. So this was Hacksaw's bye week at my cottage here in upstate New York. Although I did I did two podcasts from my cottage, uh, sometimes better than others because of connectivity problems. But uh, we'll be back in the saddle on Monday. If you like sports, check my website. I write a ton every day, leehacksawhamilton.com. And obviously, we're dazzling people, not as good as you in Winnipeg, but we're dazzling people with our own podcast on my YouTube channel, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton Sports as well as what we're doing with Instagram. And you never know what I'm going to talk about on Instagram, and I never know how all these citizens are going to react. So get a chance to sample what we're doing here this side of the border. And obviously, just around the corner, NHL hockey season starts. You'll be screeching about the Jets. I'll be covering the Kings and the Ducks and all the storylines around the NHL. So that starts this coming week. I'm looking forward to that. Hey, where exactly are the Adirondacks? Like, where, like where uh, is that in upstate New York? I told you not to cut class to go drinking when they taught geography. <laughs> I told you that. Uh, yeah, it, it, if you go to your local map, just go to upstate New York, Alexandria Bay, which is right across from Gananaque and just up, up the river from uh, Kingston. So Alexandria Bay and then just go southeast of that. I'm buried in the middle of the northern Adirondacks. I'm absolutely amazed I have Kenneth here i don't have access to cable tv so where yeah, do you we're... fly into like you fly into where and then have to drive for a while oh you bet uh unless you want to chauffeur me around yeah we actually <laughs> we go we go from san diego to charlotte or san diego to atlanta or san diego to detroit and then the connection into syracuse and then we do two and a half more hours north to get up uh east of alexandria bay so and we have beautiful weather i come here the first week of october to bring the wife up here to see the colors change up until yesterday. Fall ended. Winter has just started to arrive. If I if I flip my laptop outside, you would see it gray. I can't it's not winter yet, but I can probably see it from here. So yeah, it's I love being up here the first week of October. And of course I come here in July. So hey, we pulled this off. We didn't take a bullet getting this done. Thank you, no, connectivity. No, you sound great. And uh listen, you have yourself a great sports weekend. Put the feet up, uh, enjoy and uh don't worry, you'll be warm in San Diego sooner than that, sooner than you know it. Lee, thanks so much as always. Have a great one, my friend. Have a great sports weekend, Hustler. Good to talk to you again. You got it. There he is, the one and only Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Uh, all right, gang. We um, marbles are open. And I see many of you have already entered right now. Maybe you're a new subscriber, someone that's just jumped on over the last little while. Fridays at this time, it's our marble race. Probably the most fun thing we do every week. All you need to do is be subscribed to the channel and then go in and put in exclamation mark marbles. And in a couple minutes, we'll uh, give everyone a marble. We'll drop them. We'll see what Remus has for a course for us today. And um, we'll give away our version of the Masters Green Jacket, an exclusive blue Winnipeg Sports Talk hoodie from our friends at Shipman Associates for whoever, whoever gets across the finish line first. Um, just before we get to Remus, I do want to get to the cool bet lines while you all enter into the marble race. A big shout out to our friends at Little Brown Jug. And it was nice. We got to the rink yesterday and uh, we went to this reception 
and all of the new local beers were available. Had one of my favorites, the Little Brown Jug Generic, which is also available in both the North and South End Craft Beer Corners and the Bar Upstairs Craft Beer Corner outside Section 310. Great to have Little Brown Jug partnering with the Winnipeg Jets this year and, of course, great sponsors of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Make sure to check out Little Brown Jug on William Avenue if you haven't already, the brewery and tap room where you can try all their amazing beers, but uh, keep your eye out for their iconic 1919 generic lager and more at your local um, Winnipeg and Manitoba beer store. And hey, a big shout out to Nick and Nikki DQ. Great support since day one, since sub number one to sub 10K. Nick and Nikki have been with us. Can't thank them enough for their support. Four DQs in Winnipeg with those delicious blizzards, those amazing stack burgers, take home ice cream novelties and more. You can do see them at DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, DQ St. Anne's, and DQ Niverville. And don't forget, if you're in the Niverville area, Nick and Nikki just opened up the new Pita Pit there. Healthy, fresh, fast, delicious. Nothing like Pita Pit and amazing catering as well. Talk to them in store or hit them up on X at Pita Pit Niverville for catering options as well. All right, let's get Remo in here. Um, and you know what? Just while we do it, again, the breaking news, Vili Hanela out with a fractured ankle. Um, tough, tough news for the young Finn who seemingly had played his way into the mix for the sixth uh, sixth defense spot. But just while we get ready for marbles, I want to hit you with the why not question of the day. And it is the question that I gave Ken Weeb earlier today. But right now we're doing it with you for not Autocorp at Waverly and McGilvery. Why not question of the day as we go into game number one on Wednesday are the Winnipeg Jets better than they were last season? Are they, well, will they be more successful? I guess take an over or under on where they finished last year and uh, let us know in the chat for the why not question of the day. Uh, Remo, great hit with Hacksaw as always. Man, his connection and uh, the ma- and Adirondack. I've heard about this uh, cabin that he's got there for years. He calls it Beer Lake in the summer. He sits in a canoe. And drinks and drinks beer. But I actually want him to give us the tour. But yeah, everyone is like in chats, like, where's the books? Where's the magazines? What's going on here? But uh, yes, he's in upstate New York. Looks uh, beautiful. I never, I've heard about it over there, but never been. So that was a great chat. Our NFL looked and sounded great. And I actually do think the Jets are going to finish better than, well, I think they're going to finish about, about the same. But I, I do think, yeah, I think they're a better team. Um, than last year. I think last year, that second half, I don't think they're they're that team. They're probably not the first half team. They're probably more somewhere in, in between, but I think with the forward depth they have scoring, uh, should come, I don't know, should come better with the with the depth. And I think, you know, second year under Rick Bonus, uh, I like what they got here. I, I'm looking at the projections. I think, what did Dom have them like? 90? There was, I was actually pretty, pretty high. I was surprised. So I think, I think they're a playoff team, Huss. I know the uh, the over under on points for the season. I believe at Cool Bet is ninety four and a half, okay. and that basically puts you right on the playoff bubble. I think the Jets made it last year with ninety seven. Yeah. Florida got in at ninety six, and uh, and that was the um, that that was it. Um, there you have the uh, the playoff this is the, tiers. This is the Athletics projected team tiers. Cup favorites: Carolina, Edmonton. And yeah, cup contenders, Rangers, Dallas, Toronto, uh, De- Colorado, Vegas, New Jersey, Boston, playoff caliber, Florida, Minnesota, Pittsburgh, Calgary, and Winnipeg. And he's got Winnipeg projected 96. So right on that line, Hus, of, uh, what'd you say, 94? Yeah, not 94 and a half was their, uh, was their total, uh, their uh, over under on uh, cool bet. All the cool bet, speaking, we'll get to the lines right now. Uh, if you go to the NHL section and then click on futures, um, there you can listen. There's there's point totals, goal totals for tons of players um, in the National Hockey League. You've also got, um, you know, a few. Wow. When we originally put up that Oilers Leaf Stanley Cup final matchup, it dropped at 40 to 1 mm-hmm. and then quickly went to 35. It's been bet all the way down to 23 to 1. Um, and listen, I. I I, I don't Not know whether that. we could whether we could handle a uh, a, a Jets or a, sorry a Leafs Oilers um, 
final uh, this year. Uh, at least, I guess, it would guarantee for those that care the cup coming back to Canada. But like many, I would like the Jets to be, I would like our team to be the one that ended the drought as opposed to one of the other Canadian teams. But um, they both got wagons there in Toronto and Edmonton and not surprised why there's a lot of action on them. That's who I picked last year uh, preseason. I was like, or I knew it was pre-playoffs. I picked um, Edmonton, Toronto, and maybe we're all just a year early. Um, this is McDavid's year. I mean, you're seeing point projections for McDavid for like 100, 150 or 145. Like, it's absolutely uh, insane what this guy's doing. And He's even money, even money for the Hart Trophy. Yeah, I mean, of course. Of course, and I'd almost take it. <laughs> Seems like a good, good. I mean, if he plays a two, free like, money. <laughs> unless there's some like jokester out there who's like, well, you know, this other team wouldn't have even made the playoffs if they didn't have Taylor Hall or something. Something voter like fatigue, kind of like Zach Caleros is the MOP. Yeah, or of Patrick the Canadian Mah- Football League or Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, voter fatigue. I agree. Let's give it to someone else. But hey, I mean, you look at the history of the Hart Trophy, Huss. I mean, for the '80s. And 90s, it was basically two guys, Gretzky and Lemieux. So are we entering an era of McDavid? Or we are in an era of McDavid dominance. Hey, oh, a nice little, uh, a nice little super chat from Bozeman. Oh. Thanks, Bozeman. Our defending champ, who finally won the marble race last week. Way to go, Bozeman. And thank you very much for the support, both for the show and the marble race. Um, but listen, we do have Rick Bonus, so uh, let's just get these cool bet lines done, and then we'll hear what Bones had to say, and then do some marbles to finish it off. Game tonight, Bombers Lions. Uh, it hasn't really moved too much. It was at two. It's at one and a half right now. What we care about though is a Bombers win. Bombers on the money line is plus one o nine. Um, other games in the CFL tonight: Argos seven and a half point favorites against the Elks. Chad Kelly will play tomorrow. Riders, three-point favorites to get over the uh, Ticats. And the Alouettes, minus six and a half against the Ottawa Red Blacks. But let's head over to the exclusives. We got a Winnipeg Sports Talk parlay special today, folks. The guys were asking me, let's get a Bomber one in there today. And I'm like, all right, I'm in. Bombers to win. Kenny Lawler, anytime touchdown and a big game from that two-time MOP. Maybe he'll make it three with a big performance tonight. Zach Caleros, 270-plus passing yards, along with the Lawler touchdown and the Bombers' money line, plus 560. I am betting that as we speak live on the program. Let's go blue. Um, if you click onto the Lock Shop Partner Parlays, we've got a lot going on. We made our best bets today on the program. Our partner parlay is the Texans plus one and a half over the Falcons. We bought an extra point with the Jets. So we've got the Jets plus three and a half at the Broncos and the Niners minus three and a half against the Dallas Cowboys. That one is in at plus 610. And I also cooked one up for uh, a little ride with us. We like the Jags plus five and a half in London against the Bills. We bought the extra point with the Colts at home against Tennessee to plus three and a half. And bought an extra point with the Chiefs at minus two and a half. That one comes up to plus 525. All the NFL games are up there right now. And if you have not used the uh, played up cool bet yet, give them a try. And when you make your first deposit, use the promo code WST. And we'll hook you up with a 100% bonus on your first deposit up to 200 bucks. And the best place to go is always the exclusives. Put together some fun wagers. And then the... uh, Boys in the cool bed office ju- juice the odds a little bit uh, so it's better than you get it if you put it in yourself. It's all there right now at coolbet.com. All right, last call for marbles, everybody. Get those marbles in. If you just popped in, you're not too late. Exclamation mark marbles in the chat, and we'll get to those marbles in a minute. But uh, Remo, let's uh, let's get to uh, the Rick Bonus uh, audio from earlier today with the bad news about Billy Hanel and uh, the latest on the club as they finish practice before going on to a uh, fun weekend of a little team building before back to practice and opening the season next week. I guess first off, what we are all waiting for, and I don't know if you've got any more updated information on Billy. He has a fracture 
in his uh, in around his ankles. So uh, the next step, we're, we're not 100% sure yet. Probably be determined later today or tomorrow morning. But as I said last night, he's out for a while. But there is a fracture there. Yeah, and uh, the fractures, is there more of a definite timeline, say, than if it was a strain or twisted ankle, yeah, high a, a, ankle sprain, that sort of thing? They keep telling us that a fracture is better than a high ankle sprain. I keep hearing that. But regardless, they're both, uh, either one of them is going to be out for a long time. So uh, you're looking at, I, I have no idea, I'm not a doctor, eight weeks, eight to 10, 12 weeks, who knows, but it's a fracture, so you got to look at a minimum of eight weeks. But how do you talk to a player about how do you how do you handle a guy that, that was maybe on the cusp of making your roster and yeah. now has to deal with a disappointment that he's yeah. not, you know, something he could have Listen, he worked hard all summer to, uh, mentally and physically to get ready for training camp. Um, and he's going to have to do it again. We talked about that. And he's, we're going to send him home. Uh, there's no sense in him sitting around here for a lot longer time. So those, that first couple of weeks is better to be surrounded by his family. And then when we need him to come back and be close to start working out or whatever, then we'll get him back. But for now, the best thing for him is to go home and be with your family. You're talking Finland? Then? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And with a fracture, like, is surgery a possibility? It's or? a possibility. Okay, that's yeah. when you say next yeah. step to be yeah, determined. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't have that. But we don't have that information yeah. yet. There'll be further evaluation, and if they determine that surgery is the best course to go, then that's what they're going to do. Right. Um, Nate Schmidt, you know, he slides in today at practice. Obviously, he's at a camp where he's been dealing with a bit of an injury, but it looks like he's good to go now, and he slides into that spot. Is Do you see him potentially there with, with Brendan to maybe start the season? Well, that's that's probably a good possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Is it written in stone? No, nothing's written in stone. But uh, he's a veteran. He knows how to play. We know what we've got in him. And it's unfortunate that we couldn't get him into more games. But again, injuries, him, Chizzy, like they, all these injuries just set everything back a little bit. Uh, so you deal with it the best you can. Now it's up to us uh, and him to uh, make sure, now that he's finally back in uh, practicing with the guys and com compete and get the battle drills going, then we push him really hard our next couple of practices to see if, to make sure he's ready to go Wednesday night. It does sound like a broken record always asking about Nikolai, but I think yesterday you actually talked about Monday, so was it always kind of in the plan that he probably wasn't going to skate today? And That plan changes daily. <laughs> <laughs> we wait for him to show up. How are you feeling today? Uh, but no, so now the plan definitely is Monday, and we've got to, you know, we're all hoping that he feels 100% so he can play Wednesday. That, that's, that would be in a perfect world. So at this point, the plan went a couple of days off and uh, uh, recover. And for everybody, but more importantly for Nick, and uh, listen, we're hoping he walks in here Monday morning and says, I'm ready to go. Right. All right, so there's Bones. Um, <laughs> kind of funny talking about Ehlers <laughs> at the end. Fingers crossed. Um, we'll see him on Wednesday against the Calgary Flames. I guess we'll find out a lot more if he's at practice and how he's feeling after the weekend. And obviously the news on Billy Hainala surgery is a possibility. As we said before, he's going to be heading back to Finland to be with family for the first part of his recovery. Um, and then we'll be back in Winnipeg a little closer to uh, the end of the time frame, which is eight weeks, could be longer. Um, nevertheless, a real bummer. Um, just before uh, he uh, potentially could have been in the uh, opening night lineup after a great training camp for Vili Hainola. All right, gang, you know what it is. Marbles time Friday on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Thanks again for helping us get to 10K. I think we may have to go back to the old Temple of Steve today for the uh, for the marble race for uh, on this very, very special day. Couple, uh, one other just bomber note. It's kind of broken. Patty Newfeld out Tui Ely in uh, for the Blue Bombers tonight. So uh, not a, I mean, listen, it's never great when you're going to a backup. Patty Newfield, though, a big, big part of that offensive line. And Eli's going to have to be able to step up, uh, step up tonight. Um, Remo, uh, it's just about that time. I'm loading it up, getting it ready. If you have any bonus marbles, but did you want to touch on this uh, arena tour? Yeah, I figured we took, we'd do that now as we're... Uh, yeah, do, as we, do you want to play... Maybe you should play... Can you play the uh, the the, uh, the reel that you made? Yeah, I made a pretty... So I made a pretty sick uh, reel, Huss, trying to get into the real TikTok-style video. And, you know, you we, get it. we were given the tour yesterday, and 
I toss it out there, man. It's got a lot of views on our Instagram already and YouTube shorts, TikTok across all those. So I'm pretty, pretty pumped with how it went. Click bonus, click bonus, add it again um, with uh, some great social media. And folks, even if you're not able to view this, if you're listening on the podcast, Mm -hmm. please enjoy the five-star elite narration Thank you. on on this on this video uh i was wondering i mean usually i'm used to the the lady that is speaking on tiktok videos i'm not sure which one you click for this one but uh qu- quite the uh, quite the orator for this piece uh let's uh let's play it for everyone and they can check it out Let's go on a tour of the newly renovated Canada Life Centre, where $13 million of renovations have been completed to elevate the fan experience. First stop, the Scotiabank Wealth Management Premium Club on the event level. Enjoy elevated amenities and a delightful range of food and beverages. Going upstairs, the Bud Lounge has transformed into the Ticketmaster Lounge. Take a look at the brand new bar and expansive glass windows with the added convenience of in-seat ordering through the Winnipeg Jets app. Moxie's has made way for a spacious craft beer corner, offering a wide selection of delightful local brews for your enjoyment during Jets games and concerts. Try our favorites from Little Brown Jug. Make your way up to the Play Now Lounge, where three suites have merged into one expansive suite, featuring 88 plush theater-style seats, It's the perfect spot to unwind and savor the game. For this season, a couple enticing new food options, a variety of burgers and chicken sandwiches to churros, burritos, and the garden dog, a plant-based hot dog. Can't wait to see you at a game this season. Wow, what a (laughs) what a real what narration. I laughed out loud at whoever said, Is that AI Remo? (laughs) You uh that should be an option if you'd like to. You could you could license your voice to TikTok, and if people wanted to have that level of energy on their on their TikTok videos, reading the uh, the uh, the text, you could do that. Uh, all in all, though, really fun, awesome changes to the rink. I mean, if you're lucky enough to get down to that uh, the Scotia Bank Lounge at the uh, you know where the old hometown heroes used to be, it's unreal. And listen, the highlight of the entire thing was that premium. Um, what was it? Oh, the Plain Owl Lounge, where they have 88 seats, and that picture of us in those, those were by far the most comfortable seats I've ever been in in a sporting venue. And I tell you what, it might be tough to get back into a regular seat after that, although we did fine as we went down to uh, regular seating for the actual game last night. Yeah, it was a great tour. I love that, um, you know, they took out the Moxies, you know, when they originally, like this time last year, I went to a concert. I'm like, oh, they took out the Moxies. It's just moxies with the wall removed but no they took out all the booths and moved the bar and it's a way bigger area where they have all the craft beers you saw the fridge uh with the little brown jug 1919 generic lager and other great uh local options so uh, super fired up to ha- you'll know, be walking around taking the tour while drinking a 1919 and we did check out that play uh that play now lounge uh very cool a huge area those seats were so comfortable right uh, i felt like you were on top of the ice um, and the one thing too, the, you know, the exchange, what exchange restaurant in the basement was there for so long, had never really been updated. And, uh, they really, uh, you know, made it look like, you know, the, made it look like a nice spot to go. So if you're in, you know, a Ticketmaster lounge, formerly Bud Lounge ticket holder, you're going to go downstairs and it's going to open more, open up more stuff. Cause no one wants to go down there before, well, before. And I think they've no, made it, the made it better. The yeah. bar, the bar in the area, like yeah. before, if anyone had been in, I mean, you were just serving on that one side and they basically had two spots to get it. It now goes all the way around with, I don't know, like probably eight minimum points of sale. So uh, for those of you in that area that want to get a couple cold ones, you'll be able to do it way quicker than you've ever before. Um, so anyways, it was great. Well organized. We appreciate them including us in that in that event yesterday. And we did get to try all the food. Um, a couple things that stood out, the, uh, the hot or not chicken, uh, I guess we had, they kind of made sliders of it. Those were great. We tried the burrito from the burrito 204, a churro, um, burger as well. And a couple other things that we didn't try the, those breakfast tots at the, uh, what is it? Tots or not spot. 
um, looked very, very intriguing. So uh, some good new food options. And a shout out to Chef Richard Duncan, who uh, kind of came out and uh, showed it all off and uh, made a nice spread for everyone that was there. Yeah, I didn't try the tots. I tried, yeah, the burrito was good. I really like that hot or, or not hot chicken. Had the two sliders there. Some new options for sure. And yeah, all those options. I mean, you walk around, you see the, what, where the Tim Hortons used to be. It's uh, YWG Burger, I think. Or was that the Carvery? I mean, that they updated a lot of the concessions there. You know, the Burrito 204 as well. So that's available uh, to everyone. So, you know, looked a lot different. Uh, I mean, the the glass where that, uh, where the butt lounge used to be and the moxies, like it used to be so tight in there. And now that's brought up and uh, they were saying this, this see this Jets logo here, Hus? This is where you go when you want to take like selfies at the game, this Jets logo outside. Uh, we were with a lot of Instagrammers, influencers, yeah. Winnipeg foodies. Uh, and there was uh, there was a lot going on in front of that logo. So again, anyways, it's great. Let's go. Bring on the season. Home opener next Saturday. Hopefully we'll see you all there. Three o'clock start. And don't forget that party in the plaza beginning at noon. Um, Patrick is playing. They'll be doing the anthems as well. And a cover band, a cover band that actually does need to be seen to be believed called Wicked Awesome. Um, we saw them at a bar in town earlier this summer and uh it was it, it was wicked awesome i will just put that so uh anyways uh, let's make a plan to uh, get together if you're going to that game we will see you there at the party in the plaza before the home opener next week all right we got to get this pot yes. up we got to get this weekend going we got to do some marbles let's get a little 10k edition from tristan rivers music remo of the marbles theme and then uh then it's time to go yeah well with the announcement this week that green day is the gray cup halftime show there is only one option for tonight or this afternoon's marble race here we go it's friday another week of words gone by Deserve to treat yourself Maybe an ice cream cake or a bottle of rye No, no, day in So that you can't deny Why you sad for even for pleasure Give by luck a try It's time to do a marble race No, she's at the rain Best to worst Marble race It's time marbles with the punctuation first Marble race Don't spam or you will suffer All right, let's do this. Um, Remo, how many um, how many uh, people do we have in today? Okay, we have 231. Do you want me to add, add Hacksaw, or do you want me to add in? Add yeah, Hacksaw. Let's, add, let's add Hacksaw, Ed, and Ken. And, and you know what? Let's, let's give a good vibes marble to Vili Hanela. Sure. We got to give one into Vili. By the way, shout out to Marshall Caron. Marshall, great supporter of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Really appreciate the super chat, my friend. Uh, greatly appreciated. Good luck in the marble race. And uh, I hear Elliot in chat. When I grow up, I want to start a YouTube channel where I review all the fat boys in Winnipeg. Happy to hear Canada Life has added one more option to my dream. There is a guy that does fat boys. I believe, I, be, I follow him. Hilarious dude. I believe the account is called For the Love of Fat Boys or For the Love of All Fat Boys. And he just goes around and does fat boy reviews. Excellent. And uh, yes, I just saw Kabilis giving a shout out to Carter Chen. Our buddy Carter was there running things as always. And uh, I would also like to give a shout out to uh, one of my other favorite Winnipeg foodies, um, Jay Diz. Jay Diz Eats. Got a chance to meet Jay Diz. It was sort of like the king of the foodie crew, Carter, and the prince, Jay Diz. He's a younger fellow. Uh, but it was great to meet him and great to meet everybody there. It was a really, uh, really fun event and uh, great to try the samplings and then uh, obviously get out and uh, watch the game. But uh, it all starts for real next Wednesday in Calgary. I'll be uh, joining you from the show from Calgary for the opening game of the season next week. And then, of course, back here on Saturday for the home opener. And then cannot wait for Tuesday 
Kings in town. Many familiar faces on both sides and uh, many familiar faces with us in the Winnipeg Sports Talk section for our first game of the WST four pack. Again, if you've uh, missed it, we've got a four game package with four amazing games. L.A., Edmonton in November, Saturday night against the Leafs in January, and a Thursday night game in April against Calgary. Click on the link in the description. Grab yourself. There's a few tickets remaining across the aisle in 317. And if you're listening to the podcast, go over to winnipegsports.talk.com. Click the link and uh, and join us. Cannot wait for the 17th to see you all there. All right, Remo, let's do this. Okay, I'm doing the marbles. We have, I put in today's list, right? That's what we want, today's list. Yep. 230 sticks total. That's a lot. Nice. And we'll go to, because of 10K, we'll go with the celebratory course. A couple weeks ago, we had a special show at the Hockey for All Center, and we did Slippery Slopes, but we'll bring back another favorite, Temple of Steve. This is a good oh. one. And Temple of Steve, if you recall, has an ending where nothing is guaranteed until you're actually in the hopper because it goes back and forth. Um, this is a great way to celebrate 10K. Again, thanks to everyone that has supported us since uh, May of 2021. It was a long haul to get here, but uh, onwards and upwards. Uh, thanks to our first 10,000 subscribers and uh, welcome to the next 10. Hit that sub button if you haven't already done it and uh, hit the thumbs up button as well. All right, good luck to everyone. We're playing for a WST hoodie. It is the Temple of Steve. It is Friday. Bombers tonight playing for the West Division Championship and Jet Season gets going next week. Let's get it on and drop the marbles on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Here we go. The big, big funnel to begin the Temple of Steve. Well over 200 marbles in today's, today's championship race. The start, always important in this one, although, as I mentioned, nothing is guaranteed until you actually make it through. David Zirk with a nice start. Chucker as well. What do we got here when we get back out? Uh, David Zirk, Chucker, Darcy, sort of our top three, but it is uh, it is anyone's race right now. Getting into our first, our first obstacle, and it looks like Eric Kruald has uh, gone through there first. David Zirk coming up on the right. So kind of two marbles have separated themselves at this point, but a big crew right behind them, including Camaro, 298, Jeff Dawson, Robert Svensson, and more. Wow, this is uh, lots going on here. David Zirk got through, I believe. But I think Eric Crywald is still in first place right now. And yeah, here comes Eric with a nice, uh, with a nice little lead. Can Eric make it through? Oh, Eric does a nice job of negotiating that last obstacle, and he's got a bit of a read. We got Mary Jane. Less as well. But Erickson first, Less, Adam Douglas, Ferg, Theo Seegers, and Robert Swanson kind of in that top five. Julian Labossier in the top ten as well. All right, er Eric's out. <laughs> Eric did not make it. This is the Temple of Steve. Who is going <laughs> to be the first one down? Poor Eric had that nice run and didn't make it. Theo Seegers is the winner. Coming from behind. Adam Douglas second, Jeff Barron third. The Temple of Steve is not kind to uh, to <laughs> people with extended leads. Poor Eric, it was uh, right there for him, and then it wasn't. Um, Eric, Theo Seegers, Adam Douglas, Jeff Dorian is the top three. Dan S, Daryl Selly. The top five. And then number six was Aaron Desolette. Camaro 928 had a strong run. Finished seventh. Julian, had a boy Julian. A top 10 finish. Sean TM. And how about Phyllis with a top 10 finish as well in the marble race on our big day, getting 10K. Getting the rest of them through. 
We'll run through the uh, we'll run through the list for any of you like Bozeman that has side bets with friends as to where they're going to finish each and every week in the marble race. You can start running them down. Bravo, Bry and the Gitch, eleventh and twelfth, strong performances. All the regulars, Bridget Bardo, fourteenth, Mary Jane, seventeenth. Look at Nicole J as well. So many of the regulars with strong performances today. Fan favorite in the chat, Spency at 28th. Marshall Caron, a little bit of good vibes from that super chat, finishing uh, top 30. Kibbins, not bad, buddy. Pretty and Pionk, nicely done. There's Rob Pepper. Vili, Vili Hanela comes in at 45th. Not bad. One ahead of another favorite in the chat, Yin Vivian. Uh, there's Dark Moon, top it 50. Happy, it's Dark Moon's birthday, too. Happy birthday, Dark Moon. Hey, Dark Moon. Happy birthday. Nicely done. Royal Sports, what up, Greg? In at 53rd. You got Amy Weeb. There's Velveeta, James Barnaby. Isha Boy Bruce, another one of our homies. 65th. Keep on giving her Remo. I see Lori Love and Life there as a top 70. Yeah, here, give a shout out to Eric Crewell. Got thrown over the top. I used to play hockey uh, oh, with him years ago. Oh, Eric, used to losing going back to our River Heights days. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> it was right there. It was right there, Eric. There's Derek McGorn. Good to see you last weekend. D, Eddie Tate, 79th. Kabilis in an 84. Darren Chalice. Saw Darren at the game last night at 91st. Corbin, Leanne, and... Uh, Ron P, 98th. And then the entire list of people that got thrown over the top rope. Oh, sorry, Amanda. Better luck next time. Kiwichenko, Tristan Rivers Music, the legend. And poor David Zurich. David was right there. I mean, no one got it worse, though, than Eric. Eric was basically had it and then got screwed by the ending of the Temple of Steve. <laughs> Gregory's probably filing a protest right now on your behalf right now, Eric. He, he's not a fan of the end of the Temple of Steve, but it certainly makes things uh, exciting. Well, what a show. Started off in a bit of a downer, recapping last night and the injury to Vili Hainala. But we hit 10,000 subs right into our bomber talk with Ed Tate. People are fired up for this game tonight. And um, listen, fired up for next week. No show on Monday. I'll be coming back from the Twin Cities from the Chiefs-Vikings game. Uh, and, of course, all of you hopefully will be having a wonderful Thanksgiving with your families and friends. And then Tuesday, we're right back at it. Big, big show to recap the weekend. The latest on the Jets getting ready for the uh, start of the preseason. Or, sorry, the regular season. And, of course, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers with a full recap of tonight's game and the latest on the landscape of the CFL West, which will really be determined tonight, one way or the other, when the Bombers and Lions kick off at 9 p.m. Um, it's been a long one, so we do need to get out. Could do this for a much longer period of time. Theo Seegers, congrats again. Fire us an email at winnipegsportstalk at gmail.com. And, uh, folks, have yourself a great Thanksgiving weekend. Crack one for us tonight. Enjoy the Bombers and Lions and uh, all the sports on the tube this weekend. Go Chiefs. Sorry to you Viking fans, but I'm looking forward to taking that in. And uh, one way or the other, we'll be back. I'll be in Winnipeg with the show on Tuesday and then Wednesday from Calgary before the opening night Winnipeg Sports Talk on location for the first game of the season. And then uh, back getting ready for next week's home opener. At 3 p.m. on Saturday and the party in the plaza beginning at noon. For Michael Remus, I'm Andrew Patterson. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. Huge thanks to all of our sponsors. And the biggest thanks to all of you for helping us get to 10,000 subs on YouTube just in time to start the Winnipeg Jets season. Have a great one, everyone. And we'll see you Tuesday at 1 p.m. live on YouTube on WST. Kenny and Rennie's next. We're going to send you all over there right now. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down! Oh, Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.